Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to the SLT Millimeter Wave Learning Series, our free EMF educational series discussing 5G radiation and millimeter wave. Today's topics include the effects of EMF and millimeter waves presented by Lloyd, the effects of RF and millimeter wave sources presented by Magda, then we have um, Rob and Bruce are doing are going to introduce us to the millimeter wave meter and the difference of 5G frequencies and measurement protocols. And we have Keith, who's going to do new discoveries of millimeter wave sources. And then last but not least is Orem, and he will be doing the hunting millimeter wave towers in Southern California. So without any delay, let's uh, let Lloyd start his presentation. Thank you, Tony. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see that? Can everybody see that? Yes, Lloyd. Yeah. Great. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Lloyd. For those of you who just joined, please mute yourselves. Thank you very much. Keep your keep your microphones muted so we don't have background noise. Okay, Lloyd. Sorry. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about EMFs and electric U. Um, but first, I just want to well thank you for uh, Rob and your team, Tony. Uh, for the invitation to to speak today and and just thank you for the work you've been doing um i mean the work on this 5g meter is absolutely amazing um because uh i've been talking about this for a while emfs and um i didn't think we'd have anything this good this quick so they, this is really very very impressive um and i want to just also thank um Aurum and uh, Magda here, because uh, you've been doing outstanding work too uh, for so long. And, you know, if it wasn't for people like yourselves, then we wouldn't have this um, awareness about EMFs, which we now have. And we'd like, we'd all like it to, you know, be more awareness about this. But um, yeah, so it's really important, really, really uh, important the work that all you guys are doing. And so I just want to talk about why I'm here. So, because not everybody um, knows me. So what happened with me is one day in 2002, I answered my cell phone and I began to experience these symptoms. And these symptoms quickly became debilitating symptoms. And I was getting the symptoms not only when I was using the cell phone, but the computer, which didn't even have Wi-Fi. Uh, radio in the car, even the corded landline. So I was really, really hyper uh, sensitive, and it took me best part of ten years to get my health back on track. And then in two thousand and nine, um, I shared a video on YouTube, which was just a bit of a moan at the time, and it was like, okay, well, this happened to me, you know, with EMFs and cell phone and whatnot, and it could happen to you, and more importantly. It could happen to your children particularly because these EMFs are really, really bad news for children. And all of this just kind of blossomed into books and online courses and summits and things which I've been following. And this documentary, which uh, is my latest project, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a minute. So I want to talk about Electric U. Um, and so it's going to be it's going to be brief because it's a huge topic, this obviously. Um, but I'm going to keep it very, very, very brief. Um, but what's become clear to me on this 20-plus uh, year journey that I've been on with uh, really since this all started, this day in 2002, is that we are electromagnetic beings. We are these energetic beings. And I put electric U on the slide here. Uh, because this kind of conveys the idea, okay? Because mainstream medicine, as I'm sure most of you that are uh, attending are aware, is almost exclusively focused on uh, biochemistry. And the biochemistry is important, obviously, 
But what sits above this biochemistry is energy and information. So this is a little quote, which you can't see all of because, yeah, we've got a lot of people on. Um, but this is um, this is actually a quote from James, James Oshman's uh, book, Energy Medicine. And it's from W. Ross 80. And he was a, a distinguished neurology professor who had this 50 year career in electromagnetic fields uh, research, one of my heroes. And he talks about uh, that cells maintain their organized society. That's to say our, the cells in our body maintain their organized society by whispering together in this faint and private language. And that these whispers travel as chemical electromagnetic, electronic, photonic, thermal, heat, and phonic, uh, as in sound. And I really like this quote because it's very profound. It's kind of um, almost poetic, uh, I find. And But what he was saying was that, well, one of the things he was saying, my interpretation, is that health is about communication. And in this case, what he was talking about was this communication between the cells, communication amongst the cells. And this communication takes place in different ways. That's what he was saying, chemical and electronic and electromagnetic, et cetera, et cetera. And what he was also saying was that if this communication is disrupted, then we get dis-ease or disease. But what the science also tells us is that it's not just about communication between and within the cells, that in fact, we are surrounded by this energy field, personal energy field, and we are calling it, or science is calling it since about 20 years, the biofield. And as Dr. Beverly Rubik explains, it's this organizing field of energy within and around the body, and it's responsive to everything in our, in our environment. And each of us have this uh, biofield. So the biofield is not a new thing. Although, so some of you may have, may have never heard of this, but I'm sure some of you have heard of the aura, and it's kind of the same thing. And you know, the ancient ancient civilizations have been talking about this since time immemorial. And the, the thing is, it's a very real thing. So it's one of those things that, that tends to get um, poo-pooed. and But it's very real, and it can actually be measured, a bit like EMFs, a bit like this new meter. We've got these frequencies. We can measure it, and we can measure the biofield. So why is the biofield so important? Well, the research suggests it's a very important governor of our health. I actually believe the biofield governs all our physiology and biochemistry, the whole shebang, the biofield. And therefore, why is this relevant to this uh, conversation here that we're having today about EMFs and, and, and 5G? Well, we know that man-made Electromagnetic fields like cell phone radiation, Bluetooth, smart, uh, all these forms of wireless, almost certainly electric fields, magnetic fields, probably dirty electricity, all of this impact our biofield, that they distort our uh, biofield. And Dr. Beverly Rubik, she's done the research on this, and it shows that these, it shows that these EMF exposures uh, distort the biofield, they shrink the biofield. And what's found to be the case is that even people that are not sensitive to EMFs, that their biofield is being impacted by uh, these uh, technologies. And I mean, there's not just Dr. Beverly Rubik who's able to measure this. And uh, there's lots of practitioners um, around the world now which have technology um, that you can go and see and you can actually see uh, your your biofield. But the truth is that none of us 
would be here talking about this, talking about EMFs, if no one was getting symptoms. You know, no matter what the science said, and it says a lot, obviously, um, it's all about the health effects of these EMFs. That's what that's what matters. That's all that matters. Because any anything else is just it's it's interesting. It's uh, fascinating, uh, but it's it's really because it it's it's how it's impacting us and and living things. And obviously, there's a lot of science. Um, and anecdotal evidence to support this understanding that there are these adverse biological effects, not just on humans, but on pretty much all living things. And we're getting a, a clearer understanding as time goes by uh, exactly what that is. And I'm not going to lay all that out, obviously, because um, that would be a long presentation, <laughs> keeping it very short. Um, but I, you know, just go to uh, the Safe Living Technology website or uh, Magda Havis' website or Aura Miller's uh, brilliant website or my website, or there's places where you can go, but, you know, don't Google it. You know, there's places where you can go get this information. And so what we have is, on the one hand, we've got this emerging research that man-made electromagnetic fields are impinging our biofield and therefore impinging our health. Yeah, that's what's important. That's why I'm talking about this. It's impinging our biofield. Interesting. But it's impinging our health. Again, because the health, as I'm saying, of your biofield is the primary determinant of your physical health. So the good news is there are so many ways that we can restore the health of our biofield. And that's what I've been focusing on for uh, over 10 years now, personally, and increasingly uh, publicly uh, sharing this information. Um, I've written a best-selling book about, which is called Healing with Vibration. Um, and I've done multiple uh, online uh, summits and all of these adverse health effects are first and foremost an energetic problem. So if you if we think back to the quote I shared from W. Ross 80, it's almost like the whispers are not being heard. The whispers are getting lost. The whispers in British English, what we call Chinese whispers, it's like a parlor game. Um, but uh, the whispers are turning into gossip, um, out junk, uh, misinformation. And so the solution is obviously EMF awareness and mitigation, because this is really a, uh, a way of uh, understanding this energy, measuring this energy, dealing with this energy, reducing our exposure uh, to this energy. But it's also about embracing that you are an energetic being and all that, in, that, that, that that entails, because it's easy to say, but um, it's, it's actually something um, quite uh, profound. And so what I want to share is um, what I've been working on to help people embrace that truth is um, a documentary, a free documentary, which is coming out uh, in October uh, over four days. Um, and with the help of um, EMF experts like uh, Magda Havas here and uh, Rob Medzinger, I'll be sharing my story, um, the reality of our electromagnetic world, you know, what I may experience, you know, what I experience. Uh, because curiously, I'm actually more sensitive than ever. And yet I'm not living day in, day out with the symptoms. Um, and I'm going to be delving into the science behind this energetic approach to health with people like uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, uh, Lynn McTaggart, uh, Dr. Mo Roland McCrady from HeartMath, and over... 30 uh, experts in all 
all with a view to sharing this energetic approach to health, which incorporates this, uh, the, the rigorous EMF protection and many of the principles of the building um, biology institute, but also this innate power, this innate power that, that we all have, this ability uh, to work with energy and uh, self-heal. So again, it's totally free. Uh, there will be a paid version with bonuses, a bit like the summits I've done in the past and that other people do. Uh, for those people that want to own it, we start promoting uh, from the 8th of uh, September. So we're full on, you know, creating this thing um, at the moment. So if you're if you're watching this and you've got a list of subscribers, uh, followers, I'd love it if you could share this with your uh, followers. Um, you can sign up on I put the URL um, on the page here um electricsense.com forward slash uh, trailer and if tony wants to share that please do um and you can see the trailer so i think it's a it's a five minute trailer uh, which is on that page and you can get a a sense of um what this is about and um what yeah, you can expect so yeah Again, so the so that's um, I wanted to, yeah so that's what I wanted to share and um, purposely uh, kept it uh, brief, and um, so I'm going to uh, stop my screen share and um, pass the floor over to the next person. And thank Wonderful, you, Lloyd. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Um, all the way from uh, from England today. Um, no, from France. France. Oh, from France. France. Yeah. Sorry. Don't be fooled by the accent. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies lloyd uh, but thank you very much for joining us we really really appreciate it and i know you're unable to stay with us for the rest of the presentations so um have a good evening uh as well in france thank you so much thank you so much everybody take care thank you bye bye, -bye. Okay, Tony Ororum, our next speaker. Is you, isn't it? No, it's uh, uh, Professor Magda Havis. Magda, okay. Yes. Um, talking about the, uh, the health effects of, of 5G and um, some of her, uh, some information about her global EMF project as well. So Magda, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, um, Rob. So I'm going to talk about uh, millimeter waves um, and some of the other frequencies that we're exposed to. Um, and what do we know? We know that electromagnetic radiation is a form of pollution. We call chemical air pollution smog and electromagnetic pollution electro smog. It comes from um, stationary sources, mobile sources. It's present in your home. We have behavior that uh, changes our exposure as well as wearables. So um, we are really surrounded by this radiation and it's generated by wireless technology and electronic devices. We call it smart if there's two way communication. And many of you know, there's lots of different devices that are actually emitting microwaves and other forms of radio frequency radiation. The health effects fall into three categories, cancers, impaired reproduction, and something we call electrohypersensitivity that involves neurological and hormonal um, disorders. And together, I'm suggesting that we use the name electromagnetic illness um, uh, because this is what is happening to people. And we've known about this for a very long time. Dr. Zori Glacier was the microwave expert for the US government and US military. And he's got this very special publication that came out in 1971 that's available on the ZoriGlazier.com website. And there he lists over 2,000 publications back in the 70s. And these are the various um, health effects that he's been documenting. And they're virtually identical to the ones that are being documented more recently. So we've really known about this for a very long time. And we even know many of the mechanisms involved, the most important of which I think is oxidative stress that can lead to things like DNA damage, um, inflammation, uh, and a lot of other health effects. 
Dr. Cindy Russell in 2018 reviewed some of the health consequences of 5G wireless communication, looking at millimeter waves. And she found that there are um, technologies in mostly Eastern Europe that are using it for complementary medicine for pain therapy. And this is a good use of the technology. It's used by the military for the active denial system. And this is a thumbs up for me because it's better than shooting people. It's um, not as lethal, although it's certainly not without uh, biological consequences. Proposing millimeter waves for telecom and for the internet of things is a no-no. And the reason for that is duration of exposure. We're dealing with minutes, seconds, but with telecom, we're dealing with it constantly. And when we're talking about millimeter waves, this normally refers to 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz, although some of the technologies are lower than 30 um, in the high 20s, for example. We're told that millimeter waves won't penetrate very deeply into the skin, and so we don't have anything to worry about. And this is um, nonsense. Uh, it does penetrate and it gets moved along sweat glands and it can be moved along um, nervous impulses because the nerves come right to the surface of your skin. And there's evidence that it affects the nervous system, the heart, the immune system, and the neuroendocrine system that um, is associated with electrohypersensitivity. Not all frequencies have the same effect. Um, 55 and 73 gigahertz in some of the studies that Cindy uh, looked at cause pronounced arrhythmia, and which is something we found with uh, lower frequencies um, that are not millimeter waves. And we know that this form of radiation is very harmful to eyes causing cataracts. And so the people who are exposed to the active denial system, um, if they don't have um, their eyes closed and uh, protective glasses are likely ultimately to have uh, problems with their eyesight. Uh, Magda, can I interrupt you? And I'm so sorry to do so. Your slides are appearing blurry to all of us. And there are a lot of comments in the chat to that effect. Oh. Um, and okay. I, I've not, I'm not seen this before. I'm not sure. Would you consider uh, stopping your share? Yeah. Uh, and then and redoing it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if that clears that up. I'm so okay. sorry, everyone. Uh, no, I'm I, sorry I, about that. Well, it's not your fault. And I, 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 one of us should, we should have let you know a little sooner. Try it again. Let's see, and I'll keep our fingers crossed that it's clear. Yes, that looks clearer. Ah, good. Um, so- uh, Is that any better? Yes, yes. Oh, uh, okay. It's better, not 100% crisp, but uh, okay. Well, guys, um, what do we do? Does anybody have any suggestions on, uh, huh, interesting. What's that? Uh, okay. Uh, all right. We'll only wait another moment. Um, somebody said it happens when you have the background activated. Hmm. Well, she has her background activated in her video. Yes. And, uh, okay. Let me just go there. Uh, okay. Sometimes if you turn off video, it gives more bandwidth to the presentation. So you might want to try that too. Okay. I'll try that or lower your resolution. If I stop video and share screen. All right, try it again. That is that is crisp. Yeah, yes. Much better. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so continuing with um, uh, Cindy's uh, publication, uh, she found evidence that it impairs the immune system uh, in mice. It causes birth defects in uh, fruit flies, Drosophila, and it affects the growth of bacteria, both increasing and decreasing the growth. And also there's some evidence of antibiotic resistance caused by millimeter wave technology. Now, when it comes to 5G in infrastructure, it consists of four different elements. Fiber optics is the safest, obviously. Uh, I've been told by my uh, colleagues who are experts in satellites that the amount of radiation coming from satellites is relatively low um, and not something we need to be overly concerned about. Although there is some evidence that they can turn up the um, intensity of the radiation and that potentially it could be weaponized. So that's obviously a serious problem. There's macro cell sites that are dangerous if you're near them. And what we're most concerned about here are 
small cells because there's so many of them being um, put out. And if they're close to your home, you're going to be irradiated. Now, as Orm mentioned, uh, 5G uses three frequency bands. It has the low band, which is considered sub one gigahertz. It has a mid band one to seven gigahertz, and then it uses millimeter waves. Um, and this is the only technology uh, compared to the earlier generations that introduced millimeter waves. So the frequency of the radiation is increasing and the penetration power is decreasing. 5G will not replace 4G, it will be in addition to all other frequencies, and it's being placed about 100 meters or 300 feet uh, apart from each other. And this is going to be more microwave radiation, and I'll provide evidence for some of that. What's driving this is um, the uh, financial benefits to some groups. And according to this particular report, there's going to be 50 trillion gigabytes of data, and all of this relates to exposure. So exposures are going to increase as 5G is being uh, rolled out. Now there are losers, and I'm going to talk about some of those losers. This is um, a study by Leonard Hardell and Mona Nielsen. Mona is a Swedish journalist. And they went to this home. They've done three studies so far looking at individuals who are exposed to 5G. And this is an apartment building in Sweden where the 4G and 3G antennas were replaced by 5G antennas. And these are the bedrooms of the people um, that they monitored. Here we have the exposure location. So prior to the 5G antennas being erected, the bedroom had 900 microwatts uh, per meter squared. Uh, which is a considerable um, value for exposure. But once the 5G antennas were erected, you can see here on December, um, February and March, the levels continued to go up. Uh, the people were becoming so ill, they couldn't stay in their apartment. They moved to an office space where they were sleeping. The levels came down and then eventually they purchased a house in the country with very low exposure levels. This value here, 2.5 million, microwatts per meter squared, peg the meter, we were using the safe and sound pro two meter. And Canada's guideline is uh, about twice that, averaged over six minute exposure. So we're really comparing apples and oranges here. Uh, the 2.5 million is peak exposure, whereas Health Canada, the Federal Communication Commission and the uh, International Agency, sorry, the ICNRP, uh, are all recommending uh, short-term exposures and averages, which is useless from a biological perspective. Now, here we have the information from the previous slide, looking at the exposure, and we also have total number of symptoms. And so in the uh, pale blue, we have the number of symptoms experienced by the husband and wife. And in the dark blue, we have the sum of the intensity of the symptoms. And you can see here the symptoms listed, and the severity is given by this color code, which I call FRAG. Uh, and here we have the res results for the wife. And so you can see when the 5G was in the uh, apartment uh, that both of them, especially the wife, became quite ill and had a lot of symptoms. They simply couldn't survive. Health Canada will say um, these levels are perfectly safe. And I'd like some of those Health Canada scientists to spend a few days in those apartments. Now, Verizon um, put a map on the internet where they were when they were rolling out the 5G, and they called the millimeter waves 5G ultra wideband. And you can go to this map, you can zero in on it, and it will show you where um, the millimeter waves have been activated. And so the brown here is with 5G millimeter wave technology. And if it's just red, it means um, there is 5G there, but not with the millimeter waves yet. And so we've got two streets, 6th Avenue and 5th Avenue. And we have a group called the Global EMF Network. Um, this is a group of citizen scientists. There are well over 500 of them now. We started this um, during the pandemic um, and had a lot of volunteers from around the world. Um, and they're constantly doing monitoring that we're posting on the website that you can see here, globalemf.net. And one of our members um, in New York, I asked her if she would go out and measure these two streets because we knew that one had millimeter wave technology, the other didn't. And these are her results. And the way we did this particular study is that we um, 
monitored five street five intersections and four street corners. So these are averages. Each bar here is an average of 20 measurements. And we've got average, median, and maximum levels and showing the Russian guidelines and the Canadian guidelines as well. Once 5G uh, millimeter waves were introduced, the levels increased uh, considerably. And we asked her to do it in Brooklyn, New York as well. Same thing, uh, levels increased quite uh, substantially. And as a reminder, the median value, um, half of the uh, measurements are below the medium, half the measurements are above the median, uh, up to the maximum. And so in uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, along, I think it might be 85th Street, uh, the levels are actually um, exceed the Russian guidelines um, more than half the time. Now, there are a lot of other issues uh, apart from health, although my expertise in, is in health, but I'd like to share one with you, and that's privacy. Um, this was reported in, in the New York Times, how China is using artificial intelligence in classrooms. And here you can see that the students have these bands on their forehead, and the bands uh, are monitoring brainwave activity. And so if it's red, it means they're deeply focused. If it's green, it means they're focused. If it's blue, they're distracted. And if it's white, it means they're offline. And this information is conveyed to the teacher's iPad, who then sends the information to the uh, father. In my mind, this is a, an invasion of privacy, but it also increases exposure in the classroom. And so this is not something I would recommend uh, for teachers here in North America. In China, they also have facial recognition for purchases and they've expended, extended the facial recognition. And there were some studies to find out how quickly could someone find a person in China? And the answer is within about 15 minutes based on facial recognition. So this is something that's deeply concerning, uh, should be concerning to all of us. All of the green countries here are using facial recognition and there's only a few places in the world where it's been banned. So this is something that we need to be aware of. During the pandemic, um, I was following all the information and I was really curious as to why the, um, the incidence of cases was not uniformly distributed. And so we thought there must be some other factors involved. And indeed, many of us that were on various uh, news groups were sharing information because the symptoms of COVID uh, overlapped with the systems of, uh, symptoms of electro hypersensitivity. And we were wondering if, if perhaps in some cases, people were not suffering from COVID or long COVID, they were actually suffering from electro smog. And so we began to look at various things um, that could possibly affect the distribution of COVID. And the first thing we looked at was population density. And there's a real anomaly here. So for example, in India and in Africa, the population density is quite high, yet the incidence of cases was quite low. And if we plot uh, population density uh, versus the COVID-19 cases, there's a linear relationship with Africa just feel, falling slightly below this line. But when we add North America and Europe, there's a very different uh, trajectory. So there's something else happening in Europe and North America. In addition to population, we looked at percent elderly since older people were dying. Primarily, they were much more sensitive. We looked at air pollution and smoking since this was a respiratory illness, air travel, uh, economic issues, <clears throat> issues related to our exposure to electromagnetic fields. And here we had a very good uh, response when it came to Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, so in North America and in Europe, uh, we had uh, a lot of Wi-Fi hotspots, and that's where we had most of the cases as well. And you can see Africa has very few Wi-Fi hotspots, and it also has very few uh, cases of COVID. We also looked at things like freedom of the press and internet censorship to see if we were getting um, adequate um, data from these countries. The conclusions we came up with is that some of the correlations were weak. Um, the scale was too large and lack of standardization. So we decided to focus on the United States. And this is a paper that Angela Siang and I uh, wrote together and published in 2021. COVID-19 attributed cases and deaths are statistically higher in states 
and counties with fifth generation millimeter wave uh, wireless telecommunication technology. And here we have the small cells on various type of poles. Scientists are very concerned about them. There's a moratorium on 5G, for example. There's going to be more antennas closer to people and buildings, higher exposure, a new form of radiation uh, with the high band millimeter waves that hasn't been tested. And it's very similar to what we did with the vaccines in the sense that we're conducting a global experiment um, without uh, people uh, giving their consent. And I'm just going to share two of the results with you from this paper. Um, these are the states that didn't have millimeter waves when we were doing the uh, census. And we have the number of cases per million. And here are the states with millimeter waves activated. And if you look at the difference in the cases, there's over 2000 excess cases per million uh, when the 5G millimeter waves were activated. And this is an 80% increase in um, uh, cases per million, and it's statistically significant. And the same can be seen for the number of deaths per million. Here we have uh, almost 150 excess deaths per million and almost a doubling of those deaths. So, um, and one of the things I'd like to remind everyone is uh, in cases without um, states without millimeter wave technology, they still have radio frequency radiation. So if we did, if we compared um, these states to places that did not have microwave radiation and radio frequency radiation, my guess is this level would be even lower than it is right now. Now, because the symptoms of COVID-19 and the symptoms of electromagnetic interference are similar, um, if we had... Um, uh, if we were looking at research of people living near base stations, and many of you have seen this particular study, it's before 5G and before COVID, uh, we have uh, different distances, residential distances from base stations, we have symptoms, and we have percentage of people who experience symptoms very often. These are the symptoms and the ones that are highlighted are the ones that are common for COVID-19. So you can see there's a huge overlap. Had this study been conducted in 2021 or 2022, uh, most of the people would have considered um, with the symptoms that they were actually experiencing COVID rather than responding to uh, electromagnetic pollution. Now, what percentage of the population is affected? In my mind, um, just under 3%, I think, of the population has severe symptoms. 35% have mild to moderate symptoms. And if we use these numbers for various locations, we can see here that in Canada, over 1 million people in the United States, more than 10 million people. <clears throat> and in Europe, 22 million people have severe uh, sensitivity. They're disabled by this exposure. They're unable to work. Many are unable to go to hospitals because hospitals are now contaminated by this radiation. Some are homeless. And there are an increasing number who have cons considered made medical assistance in dying. Here we have the guidelines and I've highlighted um, the different countries and I've highlighted Canada and Toronto because Toronto actually established their own guidelines back in 1999, uh, which are a fraction of the ones that Health Canada recommends. The lowest guideline we have here is for German sleeping area. And this guideline is actually higher, 100 times higher than the level of radiation required for cell phone operation. So if 0 0.001 microwatt per meter squared is enough for cell phone operation, why on earth do we have 10 million microwatts per meter squared as the guideline? Now this paper came out just this year, uh, cell phone radiation exposure limits and solutions on how to minimize exposure. When you hold your cell phone to your head, only 6% of the radiation is, um, is going to the cell tower. 94% is absorbed by your body. And the further away from your head that you hold the cell phone, uh, the lower the radiation by the body and the greater the radiation coming from your cell phone. So anyone who can design a cell phone that would minimize this absorption uh, would make a big difference in terms of health. Now, we, the guidelines that I've shown here fall into two categories. One is acute exposure, six to 30 minute average. Um, and then we have precautionary long-term exposure, which is obviously much more protective. 
Now, we're told that the reason we have 5G is so that we can download videos faster. Uh, indeed, if you compare the 3G, 4G, 5G, instead of taking minutes uh, to download a video, uh, it's taking a few seconds. And this is absolute nonsense. People feel that the download speeds for videos is absolutely fine. They wouldn't be rolling out billions of dollars worth of antennas just so we can download a video in a matter of seconds. What's really driving this is the Internet of Things. And within the Internet of Things, what's really driving this is surveillance. You need the high speeds in order to uh, follow the population. Now, the present situation, about a third of the pu public is um, adversely affected. If we end up doing nothing, uh, the levels of exposure are going to increase and it's going to uh, make a lot more people unhealthy as a result. If we do something, um, and it has to be more than just sticking your finger in the hole, um, but we could actually reduce the levels uh, so that no one would suffer. And one way of doing this is um, with the motto, if it doesn't move, it doesn't need to be wireless. So things like smart meters, smart appliances can be wired so that they're not emitting uh, any form of radiation. A society that doesn't care, take care of its children doesn't have a future. And unfortunately, what I see um, as the future of developed countries is anxiety prone children taking care of their neurologically damaged parents. We need to stop this insanity. If not us, who? If not now, when? And these are some um, excellent websites that I recommend uh, people go to. And if you take a screenshot of this particular slide, you'll have it for your files. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Magda. Thank you very much for that, that presentation. Um, you do a great job always, and we're so lucky to have you nearby us, just a few hours away down the road, and um, yeah, it's just it's, it's just great. So, um, forum. The next the next speaker will be um, myself, <laughs> and uh, and also one of our product developers, Bruce Hildesheim. So he'll be uh, joining me at the tail end of that presentation, and then we'll have uh, Keith Cutter and Orum after that. So I will uh, go ahead and um, grab the screen and start the presentation. Okay, so um, I am Rob Metzinger, and in case you uh, have not met me before, um, I am the founder of Safe Living Technologies and been involved with building biology for years and years. Um, I'm also electronics engineering technologist. So um, yeah, as a, as, a, as a techie guy, this, this sort of thing kind of piqued my interest years ago and um, attracted me to this, this area or this field of, of business. And um, yeah, we've been at it for about 20 years and uh, just continue learning every day. And all these presentations just um, help build all that information and uh, just keep you going in the forward direction. Um, we're in a, <clears throat> an industry of flux. It continually changes and we're continually learning new things. And just like with these millimeter waves, we're, we're learning what devices transmit them, how to measure them and, and so on. So um, it's just another thing we have to figure out and thing we have to to learn to deal with. So um, just going to give you um, a little bit of background about our, our millimeter wave meter that we've uh, just put out on the market um, um, in the last month or so and uh, show you how it operates and tell you a little bit about the development of it as well. So for a brief introductory video, um, I'll just pop this up. It's our YouTube video on our website. And it'll give you a basic introduction to, to what the meter can do for you. The new Safe and Sound Pro Millimeter Wave Meter is the first consumer level 5G millimeter wave meter. This meter measures high band 5G signals between 24 to 40 gigahertz and comes with multiple accessory options for more detailed readings. These options include a horn antenna, a stub antenna, and an attenuator for various uses. To start the unit, press and hold the power button. After that, your battery level will appear on the screen.
The mode and max reset button will allow you to capture your maximum values of RF exposure. Now you can attach your desired antenna. To start, we will be using the stub antenna. The stub antenna is ideal for most uses. It has about 50 degrees of coverage in the front and back. It is suggested to slowly move the meter around in a figure eight motion while in use. The horn antenna is great for more directional measurements. It has about 35 degrees of coverage in the front. Finally, the attenuator is ideal for when your RF readings are maxing out the device. If this happens and the attenuator is not installed, the meter will display a brief message and automatically shut off. When the attenuator is attached, it will display the readings as 100 times weaker, so you are able to measure at higher power levels. When measuring RF sources using the attenuator, ensure you multiply the value by 100 to attain the correct reading. Overall, the Safe and Sound Pro Millimeter Wave Meter is the perfect partner to the Safe and Sound Pro 2, our low and mid-band 5G meter. For more information on the new Safe and Sound Pro Millimeter Wave Meter, the Safe and Sound Pro 2, and other EMF mitigation products, please visit our website at www.safelivingtechnologies.com. Okay, so a little bit about our meter there and a little bit about the development of the meter as well. Um, in order for us to do this in a reasonable amount of time, um, we had to construct our own full anechoic chamber so that we were able to test signals. Um, it allows us to test signals from around 700 megahertz all the way up to infinity. Um, so way up in the high gigahertz range. Um, and this is a, a full anechoic chamber, which means the ceilings, walls, and floors are shielded with the, the, this anechoic foam. Um, a lot of the test, testing sites out there are semi-anechoic chambers, which have metal floors. And with millimeter waves, it causes a lot of reflections and it can really skew the reading. So we, we wanted to do this, this right. We wanted to be in an area, we wanted to have this in an area where we could just develop something, go in and test it, develop something, go in and test it. So um, we had that right at our fingertips. So that was a, a great help in, in designing this meter. Um, Bruce can attest to that later. Um, so we also purchased our own signal generators, power meters and spectrum analyzers from one megahertz to 40 gigs. So we could do all this testing as well. So. Um, if we wouldn't have done this, uh, we'd still be waiting for this meter. Um, so it just really sped up the development of the meter for us. So a little bit about the meter. Um, the, the base model is the, the standard model that we have, and it covers 20 to 40 gigahertz in the high band of uh, 5G RF. And uh, so the USA 5G band covers 28 gig and 39 gig. So we wanted to make sure we could cover both of those bands. Um, it's live in major cities, um, wire, uh, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile and DISH um, transmit those signals and you need a special phone in order to access that, those frequencies. In Canada, we're looking at 26, 28 and 38 gigahertz uh, millimeter wave bands, um, but technically they're not deployed yet, we don't think. Um, we are finding some surprises out there, um, so we expect the auction to be um, um, in 2024 and um, more to come in Canada at that period of time. But um, we are finding readings out there at this point in time. They could be test sites, they could be other millimeter wave sources, so um, we're still investigating that. So they're called millimeter waves because of their wavelength that's underneath one centimeter. Um, the industry calls them, as Magda said, wide, ultra wide band UW or 5G plus. Those are the symbols you're going to see on your phone if you're connected to that service. And for the base model with the, the stub semi omni directional antenna, which is um, the which is a great uh, standard antenna to use um, is 849 US. And we did release this on June 30th. They are in stock and uh, online and ready to ready to go at this point in time. Um, we did have a large pre-order list, but all of those are fulfilled. So we're, we're caught up with that and they're in stock ready to go. Um, for more information, you can just click on that um, when you view the digital PDF of this presentation to get there if you like. And some of the features. Um, so there is also a horn antenna, as you can see on the left here. Um, the stub is a semi-omnidirectional and the horn is a directional antenna. 
And both of these detect and measure 5G in the millimeter wave band, um, covering 20 to 40 gigahertz common sources, um, high band cell phone towers, high band cell phones, radar, um, automobile radar, point-to-point uh, -point communication dishes. Discover what more is out there. Um, they're built in North America. We're very, uh, very proud of that. Um, and they're consumer level and affordable. So accurate and affordable and a fraction of the cost of, of these uh, spectrum analyzers and other high band detectors out there. And also, I think we have higher sensitivity than most meters out there as well, too. Um, so the digital display displays in microwatts per square meter and volts per meter, and also average. Um, it has a peak hold feature and response time is less than 50 microseconds, so it's still picking up fairly quick signals. And battery life was another challenge. We're, we're getting about six hours with sound on our meter, which is, which is adequate and good. Um, the audio feature we have as well, so it's similar to the Safety Sound Pro 2. Each source has its own unique sound and we have three volume levels on this meter as well. <clears throat> We also wanted um, a way to indicate your measurement quickly. And um, kind of like our Pro 2 and Classic, we included the LEDs, the four colored LEDs, and you can see the, uh, what each color represents there on the right in that, in that chart. And basically you look at the meter if you want a quick understanding of, of your exposure, green is good, red is bad. So um, that's one quick way to do it as well. Understanding the reception patterns of the antenna are critical, especially in building biology use. Um, if we look at the horn first, it's a directional, so it has about a 35 degree beam width on the front, and it only measures to the front, not to the back. So it'll measure left side, left, right, a little bit up and down, but about a 30 degree cone or beam. Um, that's kind of how you define the reception pattern on the horn. And with the, uh, the stub, it's semi-omnidirectional, and it's got a 50 degree beam width to the front back. Um, it does measure from the front and from the back. And um, this beam width is left, right, up and down as well. So you can kind of see um, the, uh, the, the space where it's gathering RF signals and information from and compiling those numbers, putting them on the screen. And it also has some side lobes too. So it does pick up some from the side as well, not as well um, than it does from the front. So that's basically the reception pattern for that omni, semi-omnidirectional meter and our antenna. And this stub antenna will also yield higher readings than the horn antenna. And for obvious reasons, it's just gathering more energy from more directions um, because it's a semi-omnidirectional antenna. So looking at a little bit about the specifications, so the stub antenna or semi-omnidirectional antenna it's got a frequency response of plus, and five, plus or minus 5 dB from 20 to 40 gigahertz. And it's also effective down to 18 gigahertz with reduced tolerance. So the, the smallest signal it can measure is, is five microwatts per square meter. And the highest measurable signal without an attenuator is around half a million microwatts per square meter. Um, the best reception, this, uh, this antenna has an SLT logo on it. So you want that logo facing um, outwards and a blank side facing you as the, uh, the operator of the meter. And that will yield the best results in, in your measurements. Um, the horn antenna, the directional antenna, it has a frequency response plus or minus 6 dB from around 25 gig to 40 gig. Um, it is more sensitive. Um, it, is a, it goes down to 0.5 microwatts per square meter and the maximal measure, maximum measurable signal would be about 30,000 microwatts per square meter without the attenuator. And this was all customized. Um, this is all part of our research and development, getting, making our own um, horn antenna um, that's compatible with our meter and works in this frequency range. So that's all customized for, for SLT. Um, then we have the attenuator, which is good. So uh, I would have liked to measure a little bit higher than 500,000 microwatts per square meter. So we came up with this antenna design. It's a 20 a minus 20 dB attenuator and or 100 times signal reducer. So you attach it between the antenna and the horn or between the antenna, the horn or the, or the meter. 
And basically when you get a reading on this, you'd have to multiply the display by 100. So it allows the meter to display higher power density signals by a factor of 100 and the range up to approximately 2 million microwatts with the stub antenna and the attenuator and approximately 120,000 microwatts per square meter with the directional horn antenna. We did have those values a little bit higher before and um, just to err on the side of caution, we just want to, we just wanted to lower that a little bit. Bruce can explain a little bit of that as well um, when he takes over the presentation. Um, with this attenuator, so it's a built-in uh, power overload protection. And uh, um, so the RF detector circuit is susceptible to damage if exposed to continuous high levels of RF. It is unlike our other meters where that's not a concern. But in this case, in the millimeter wave band, it is a concern. So we had to build in this overload protection um, and is activated when the following power densities are exceeded if the stud exceeds half a million microwatts per square meter sustained, and the horn antenna exceeds 30,000 microwatts per square meter sustained, we kind, of, we kind of put the meter into shutdown state. And the meter will power down after three seconds of elevated exposure and displays a warning message you know, over power and simply install the attenuator um, if you wanna measure these high power density readings. And you can, you can do that safely with the attenuator. So the actual operation of the meter, just looking at the startup screens, this is the startup screen. And first it does a self calibration, then it shows your battery life. And you can also run continuously if plugged into a USB-C power cable. Um, and it will say where the bat number is here. Um, it will say USB um, instead of the percentage of battery. That's how you can tell that you're, you're active and you're running on US power, USB power. Um, so the second screen that comes up is the antenna selection screen. And that antenna is selected via the mode switch, which is this button right here. And um, when you press the mode switch, it will toggle this arrow from stub to horn or vice versa. And um, basically once you've selected the uh, antenna you like, hold the mode button down for three seconds and that will select and set your desired antenna for um, the time that the meter is powered on. When you power it off, you'll have to do this reset one more time. So the different measurement types, the front panel, we have peak, we have max of the peak, and we have average. So these are the three um, uh, types or modes of measurement that we've um, incorporated into the meter. And it also has a headphone jack, 3.5 millimeters, so you can listen to it in private if you like. And <clears throat> then we have the power button here, basically holding it down, turns the unit on. And then <clears throat> once the unit's on, it acts as a, a speaker on off button with um, three levels of sound. And we have our USB uh, um, uh, port here, where you can plug it into USB power and monitor continuously. And um, then we have the mode selection switch to select antennas. And we have, this doubles as a max reset button. And also if you hold it down um, <clears throat> for a period of about five seconds, it'll change the, the units of measurement from microwave or from, uh, sorry, microwatts per square meter to uh, volts per meter. So we do two, offer two units of measurements with this device as well. And um, some future meters that are coming down the pipe, we're thinking about 200 megahertz to eight gig, as well as the 20 to 40 gig meter. So having two and one, um, or just developing a eight gig to 20 gig meter as well, or, exactly. And then um, also thinking about the high band of Wi-Fi, which is in the 60 gigahertz range. So having a 40 to 60 gig meter, and even higher than that, 60 to 90, <clears throat> we are gonna need that for some of the car radar, which I'll show you in the next few slides here. We're up actually into the 76 gigahertz range for that. So we're also looking for suggestions and uh, um, compiling these new meter designs and starting to march forward with them as, as soon as we're able to. So um, here's a quick demonstration of a, uh, um, a millimeter wave in action, actually um, measuring a vehicle. 
So it's a, an RF vehicle scan. And in this case, it's 2020 Lincoln Nautilus SUV. And I will just go ahead and play this and show you what we found here. Hi, this is Rob at Safe Living Technologies. Today, we're gonna to take our millimeter wave meter into the field and do some testing. 20 Lincoln Nautilus. It's a hiring vehicle. It has a lot of the bells and whistles and we're gonna use the millimeter wave meter to see what type of radio frequency waves are coming off this vehicle. So I'm going to turn on the meter. Um, I'm going to use the stub antenna and I'm going to turn the volume up. Car is currently powered off and you can hear that hissing noise right now and the value is less than five microwatts per square meter. So that basically means there's no signal present at this point in time. So what we're going to do is just we're going to take a loop around the vehicle just to make sure that uh, nothing is emitting when the vehicle's off and our background levels are qu fairly quiet. So we just went down the driver's side, now we're coming around the back bumper. Um, approaching the passenger side. And moving up. Things are still quiet. I would ex expect to hear sounds coming off of this as well if we're getting digital pulses coming off the car. Um, now we're at the front bumper, we're moving around the front of the vehicle, and it seems to be quiet. There does not seem to be any emissions coming from this vehicle as it's turned off. So the next step will be to turn on the vehicle and we'll repeat this measurement process. All right, so um, we're repeating the process with the car turned on. So the automobile is idling, it's in park. So let's go around the vehicle and see what the readings are. See if we can detect any RF in the millimeter wave range coming off this vehicle. So we're now we're moving down the driver's side, going towards the back of the vehicle. Still looks pretty stable. I actually just picked up a reading now, so I'm gonna turn up the volume here so we can hear it as well. And it seems like right around the back bumper here, you can probably see one of the sensors down here as well. This is kind of where we're getting our highest readings, right in this general area. So there's definitely emissions coming out of this part of the bumper. And this is the driver's side bumper, rear bumper. And we'll go towards the middle of the tailgate. Um, really nothing there. I'm gonna hit the reset button clear the values and then go over to the passenger side bumper and we can see the same emissions coming off the passenger side bumper in this location too. So now we're moving, I'm clearing the peak and I'm moving around to the side of the vehicle and once we get to the back passenger door it seems to go away so it seems to be transmitting out of that rear bumper on the left and right hand side and that makes sense because it's a blind spot sensor that's where your blind spot is and that is uh, um, what it's supposed to do so um, just making a rounds to the front of the vehicle it's still running and we don't see any emissions coming off the front at this point huh Okay, sorry about that. I just got uh, popped out of presenter mode there. So, um, so yeah, there, there you have it. Uh, vehicles um, emitting microwave radiation um, in the millimeter wave band. Hi, this is. And um, so, what can we, what can we do about this, or um, what, what direction can we turn? So, each of us, if we, if we go to our owner's manual um, and service manuals under the customer information um, um, heading. There's something called radio frequency certification labels. I found this very interesting. I, I haven't found it until I just started investigating this in the last few weeks. And for, for this particular vehicle, um, here's a list of the radio frequency certi certification labels in the, um, the, in the service manual. And it, it lists them, it lists the licenses transmitting um, um, certificates for the various countries and for the various uh, frequencies and systems that it uses. So 
very good piece of information to look at. And you, you can do that with your own car to see um, what your car is producing. So once you open those up and get into that, um, I opened up the blind spot information system sensor um, part of this. And I was able to find FCC and Industry Canada um, certifications. So if you type in those numbers in the FCC website and Industry Canada website, it will give you a ton of information about the transmitters. And most importantly, it'll tell you the frequency of the transmitters. So I looked this up and it came out at 24 gigahertz. So um, there are places you can find information about this on any vehicle and it's in the owner's manual and service manuals. Well, so um, looking deeper into this document and these documents, this SUV, SUV contains 10 FCC certified devices slash RF transmitters. This was, this was news to me, um, but here you can see by looking all these up, it took me about an hour, hour and a half to do this, looking up all those FCC um, certificates, going into them and looking up the frequencies, we can see all the frequencies here that are being emitted by this vehicle. And we can cover some of them, we can't cover all of them. Um, to cover all of them will be our goal in the future, but this just gives you an idea of what's out there. And this was for a Ford Lincoln. So I'm going to go out there on a limb a little bit and say probably a lot of the new Ford vehicles or Lincolns as well, probably have all these in common because manufacturers wouldn't switch between two or three different types of transmitters. You know, they would go with um, the same ones. So that's the information I found. Um, hope you guys find that useful. And um, so I thought, well, I got this emitting from my vehicle and I want to get rid of it. So how do I get rid of it? So if you go into the on-screen menus and you go to the driver's assistance screen, you would think that if you uncheck blind spot recognition, which I did, that 24 gigahertz signal would stop coming out of my bumper, but it didn't. So this I need to play around with a little bit more to try and understand how we can disable some of these items, but it doesn't appear you can disable that. Um, so these are the other items that to be concerned about, the, the cross traffic alert, the cruise control, the driver alert, the lane keeping um, system, and also the pre-collision system as well. So all of these are possible candidates for transmitting microwave radiation in a millimeter wave band. So that, I just wanted to bring that uh, important piece of information to your attention. Um, and this kind of, the next item is kind of a little bit of a sidebar, and then I will uh, pass it over to Bruce here. But, um, you know, in our previous seminars um, and webinars, Orem has discovered millimeter wave signal travel through glass to some extent. Um, we have pretty well proven that they have difficulties going through ceiling and walls and floors and other pieces of metal. So how do we shield our home and automotive glass surfaces? So Signal Protect Clear Window Film, um, there was this discussion at the end of the last webinar, webinar on how effective it would be. So um, I asked some of the guys in our shop to do some quick tests for us. So um, Signal Protect Clear is an option. So a quick performance test on it. So what we did here is we had a, a 26 gig transmitter. Um, we um, cranked it up to 31,600 microwatts per square meter. Um, and we are using our uh, safe and sound uh, millimeter wave meter to measure the, uh, um, the strength of the signal. Then we're inserting a piece of shielding material two inches between the two and uh, seeing what the results are. So what we did is we, first of all, we wanted to make sure that this was a valid test and it worked to our, uh, um, um, it worked well. So what we did is we stuck a piece of aluminum foil or aluminum foil shielding in between it. And we know it has very high attenuation capability. So we wanted to see a near zero response and we did. So the, the aluminum foil resulted, um, you know, with a source of 31,000 microwatts per square meter, the meter set less than 0.5 microwatts per square meter. So there's a greater than 50, 50 dB reduction with aluminum foil. It's actually probably up around 100 dB but you can see the reduction here. And then we did the same with our signal protect clear film and it allowed 4.69 microwatts to come through that film. So it ended up in a minus um, 38 dB um, shielding attenuation, which is, is, is pretty good. So um, we're pretty confident that signal protect clear will, will block these signals coming through glass. Um, it's easy to install in um, flat glass and homes, but has it's more of a challenge in, in automobiles, but 
um, it gives you some options anyways, just sitting in traffic and in bumper to bumper traffic with all these millimeter wave signals, um, it could uh, definitely uh, reduce your exposure inside of a vehicle. Okay, so that ends my presentation. So I'm gonna pass this along to Bruce Hildesheim. Um, he's part of the SLT uh, product development team. I've been working with him for over 10 years now. Um, he's classified as an analog and RF specialist, and he will be discussing uh, the millimeter wave meter and millimeter wave measurement strategies as well. Um, Bruce, um, I have you up on the next slide here with your flow chart, and uh, please continue on. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Rob. Thank you, everyone else. Um, Rob, if you could just get, uh, uh, put me on the camera. I just want to do a, a brief introduction for one minute before we look at this slide. If you could just, uh, I don't know if that's possible for you to exit out of your presentation mode for a moment and then come back a minute later. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, Orem, can we blow Bruce up there? <laughs> How about, how about maximize the video? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I stopped your share your screen sharing, uh, Rob. Uh, Bruce, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I should be on there right now. Um, again, uh, thank you, Rob, uh, and everyone else. It's, it's truly wonderful to see uh, these people here. Um, the last time, or maybe the previous time, I was in an anechoic chamber. And now I'm in the exact opposite. And I wanted to just show this to people just to show... Um, I was an electrosensitive person myself, and this is where it all started. I was one of Canada's youngest licensed ham radio operators, and I was exposed unintentionally to a lot of RF because I trusted the industry safety standards. And uh, later on in my life and my career, I came across with uh, David Giesel, another engineer, and the two of us are co-inventors and developers of all the safe and sound products. And I knew Rob since 2014 when I really discovered that I was electrosensitive. And so if there is some good that comes out of adverse uh, situation, uh, Lloyd mentioned that he, you know, his experience uh, was kind of inspiring to hear his experience because I'm more sensitive than ever, but I'm not suffering the symptoms because I know what to do with it or, or know how to mitigate these things. So I can still use, these, use this equipment um, uh, but I, I'm aware of what to do to protect Greg, sir, myself. You? And I hear somebody's microphone I'm, on. I muted them. Okay. Thanks. Can everyone, everyone who's not a not a speaker, please mute yourselves. Thank you. Okay. So that's that's how it started. So if there is some good that comes from adverse situation, uh, like in the case of Lloyd, look at what he's doing. And in the case of this, if it wasn't for my electrosensitivity. Um, quite honestly, the safe and sound meters wouldn't exist. And as Rob mentioned, uh, it was quite a process to come up with a, a millimeter wave meter, something that, uh, that was very sensitive and very accurate. And so Rob, if you could go back to that, uh, or Orem, if you could put Rob back to screen sharing, and then we'll go back to that slide again. Rob can do that. Okay. Got to find it again on his desktop. Yeah, it's... Uh, Sorry, Rob. It's vanished on me. I'll get it. I'll get it. There it is. There it is, yeah. We got it. Okay. okay. All yours. Great, right. So Rob mentioned in the presentation, initially when we released the, the product, we uh, with the attenuator, we were we were we had much higher um, levels that this meter could could uh, uh, measure with the uh, 20 dB attenuator. In other words, uh, multiply your screen readings by 100. I uh, we decided to uh, lower that value until we can do testing. One thing that you'll notice, and, and since, since I've been involved in the development and, and uh, manufacture of these meters along with David Kiesel, is that we wanted to always provide, and Safe Living as well, wanted to provide lab 
certified lab tested equipment. In other words, especially now in the future, when we have medical professionals involved in this, in mitigation and measuring uh, to, to diagnose and to help understand what's happening, lab certification and, and lab testing qualification is extremely important. So the reason we're lowering the maximum levels to the 2 million microwatts per square meter with this with the stub antenna or 120,000 somewhere around there with the horn is that that's all we can test at at the moment that's that's the maximum amount of rf millimeter wave power we can generate at the moment in the chamber now we're looking to increase that so that we can properly test that so um, the reasoning for lowering is just simple that we don't want to release specifications for a meter unless we're absolutely certain. So the other thing is, if you're in an environment where you've got multiple millions of microwatts per square meter coming at you from the from the uh, semi-omni antenna, um, you, you're, you've got to be concerned whether it's a few million or, or 10 million, you you've definitely have an issue that needs to be looked at. So I won't talk through this flow chart in, in detail, but the idea behind this chart is to encourage people to use the semi-omni antenna as the tool, as the antenna for measurement. Why? Because a semi-omni antenna, or ideally a perfectly omnidirectional antenna, is the closest thing, I think, to a human body. A human body is not a horn antenna. We don't only pick up RF from certain directions. Our body picks up everything, just like Lloyd uh, touched on. And so, what what we did here, what I did for for Rob was make this flow chart. It's like we, you know, it, just a process to go through. That unless your power measurements are above a certain level, don't use the attenuator. There's no need for it. So we're starting with the starting with the omni antenna, and then you go to is is your measured level that you're seeing greater than uh, five hundred thousand? If not, then take your measurement. Now, the horn antenna comes in handy. You might have a, a measurement in a few hundred thousand microwatts per square meter and don't know exactly where it's coming from. Well, at that point, you can switch to the horn antenna, and then you can, you can use the horn antenna to find out where it's coming from. But again, I would like to say that if your measurements are, are, are strong enough to, 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 to measure something with the omni antenna, with the, with the stub antenna, that is the antenna to use. Okay, so I won't go through the whole flow chart, but the idea is with these with these light green triangles, you answer question yes or no, and you just follow this. So Rob at Safe Living can make this flow chart available, uh, I think, on the website. I would just like to touch the purpose in the bottom left, the, the purpose of the omni antenna. It's it's used primarily, it's it's used for measurements in consideration of total body exposure. So that's the antenna to use. And the horn antenna is used for point source detection, direction finding, okay, or measurements. Or if you're in an area that's so fringe, you know, some of the maps that Magda showed in, in New York City, for example, if you're in one of these fringe areas that there might be some millimeter wave, but it's not strong enough. In other words, the measurements from the stub are below or near five microwatts per square meter. Well, sure, at that point, then the horn is, is very useful. Um, you can put that on and get some get some measurements, right? But again, uh, the idea is that the horn is used only when uh, when there's no other, uh, w when the stub antenna can't measure anything. And then the horn antenna turns this meter into an extremely sensitive device that can give you some more information. But as I've mentioned a few times, in consideration of total body exposure, and I think for valid um, uh, building biology guidelines, um, the stub antenna is the way to go. And also the stub antenna offers the greatest uh, frequency range covering from 20 to 40 gigahertz. And you know, based on the frequency response plot that we've tested, even some, some useful information down to 18 gigahertz. And the horn antenna has got amazing sensitivity and it has its place, but the frequency response is reduced from 25 to 40. So I just wanted to clarify that, um, but uh, um, I think that's it, Rob. And, and thank you everyone for, for uh, taking your time to listen to this. And it's truly inspiring that the work that I've done here and the work that we've done, uh, that I've done with David, 
Uh, and my experience suffering, really suffering with problems from electrosensitivity, that that could experience could turn into something positive and to see these tools out there in public being used by people and helping people is truly inspiring. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, always appreciate your technical input. Um, that's great. Um, so next on our list, um, we have Keith Cutter, um, who was original beta tester for our meter. And um, he has made some discoveries that uh, are kind of unexpected. And uh, um, we like uh, we asked uh, Keith to 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 come forward and present his discoveries um, in this session. So um, I will turn it over to uh, to Keith now, and um, let's try and get your uh, your screen shared properly there, Keith. Okay, <clears throat> and I apologize if my screen share looks a little bit different. I wasn't trying to be a rebel here, but this is what I'm able to do. Are you able to hear me and, and uh, see the screen chair okay? Yes. Sounds good. Yep. Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking about other than millimeter wave exposures associated with uh, smartphones and smartphone infrastructure. So we're looking at all the things, or not all the things, but at least two of the things that are um, millimeter wave and don't have to do with smartphones or the infrastructure that supports smartphones. Excuse me, Keith, for one sec. Um, would you be able to turn your volume up just a touch? Is that any better? It is, yes. Yes. Thank you. So by way of brief introduction, I'm a 38-year survivor of what I call electromagnetic poisoning, who's learned how to build non-native EMF resilience. And now I spend my time helping other survivors as well as clients wanting to take a precautionary approach to harmful man-made electromagnetic radiation. I do assessments, remediation, and design services. I produce a weekly syndicated podcast, um, Apple, Spotify, Google, other platforms, primarily for other poisoning survivors and a more mainstream offering on uh, YouTube with the handle at EMF Remedy. So I, um, I thought I and my clients were safe. <laughs> Safe from millimeter wave RF exposure here in what I like to call the majestic inland northwest. I thought we were safe due to the rugged terrain and the low population density, which are usually great things for avoiding RF exposure. Thinking that would make it unlikely that they would implement millimeter wave 5G here. And I think that's true. I think we're going to be spared that at least for a while. As a beta tester for Safe Living Technologies new millimeter wave RF meter, I learned that we are safe now from the millimeter wave 5G, but not millimeter wave RF from other sources. In fact, there seems to be plenty. So my conclusion is that areas that are thought to be safe from 5G millimeter wave deployment have I'll just say unexpected challenges with millimeter wave RF exposure and areas already exposed to 5G millimeter wave deployment will have additional unexpected millimeter wave exposure. And I just want to note parenthetically that for myself and as well as for my sensitive clients, I'm always looking for that thing that unexpectedly makes my, one of my clients ill. We think we've identified every source and they're feeling terrible. And I feel like this new meter has opened up a new world of finding things that I think may be contributing. And uh, now that we recognize them, we can, we can take certain steps to minimize. So today I'm gonna to be talking about two types of exposure. Rob's already alluded to one um, that will unfortunately affect almost everyone. I mean, who doesn't visit grocery stores, for example, who doesn't spend time on or uh, near vehicle byways? So we'll also be talking about ways to minimize uh, personal exposure. And let's talk first about supermarkets. So 
here's the problem. The door sensors, which control the portals of entry, the sliding doors that open automatically as you enter and exit, here in the Inland Northwest anyway, and I suspect across the U.S. and possibly beyond, all of my regional and national grocery stores bathe their customers with extreme levels of millimeter wave RF. So in order to get at the goodies inside the store, you have to go through these portals. You have to enter the store in some fashion. And if you go through these doors, these self-opening doors, in every case in my area, you're going to be exposed to millimeter wave radiation. So we have three regional chains and one national change in the immediate area where I live with the new Safe and Sound Pro millimeter wave RF meter, I was I entered and exited each store three times. That's the mathematician in me because I wanted to average the numbers. <laughs> I regretted it after the first store because I felt sick <laughs> just from going in and out of the store, the uh, the door three times. Anyway, the averages are shown here, and they range from just over eleven thousand microwatts per square meter to just under 23,000. And I can't help feeling, like I alluded to before, why I felt for the last many years slightly disoriented when I enter a supermarket. Does anybody else have that experience? You know, I thought it was maybe the lighting and the un other unnatural features of the in-store environment. And now I'm wondering if what part millimeter wave exposure plays. So I'll say this, you know, again, after entering and exiting three times, I definitely felt it. So since I've been around for a little while now, I know you don't need millimeter wave RF for controlling a door opener. There are many other options. In my life, I've seen pressure mats. It's sort of a, usually like a rubberized surface in front of the door. And that's the first incarnation I remember of automatic opening doors, but that worked fine. It just uh, completed a circuit when you stepped on the mat and the door swung open. Next that I recall were photoelectric eyes. So like a flashlight sort of a thing on one side and a photoelectric eye on the other. And when you walk through the beam, the doors would swing open and that worked fine as well. Uh, doorman, <laughs> you know, that worked as well. So all of which open the doors without any RF exposure. I'm sure there are other technologies as well. So I'm left wondering, why do all the stores in my area, like every single one of them, using millimeter wave tech for this? Is it worth the potential harm? Do we risk burying an epidemiological signal that millimeter wave exposure is harmful by exposing everyone? That's really, you know, what I'm wondering. Would you pay an extra penny, an item, to pay a, a doorman slash greeter? <laughs> I don't know. I would. So I have to tell you about a my ridiculous camera and meter setup for the purpose of sharing something on video. And I just want to say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run a couple of video clips, one for this and one for the, the vehicle situation. And... It was a real Rube Goldberg kind of a contraption, as I recall. It had a cardboard box and a, a piece of shelving and a liberal amount of gaffer's tape. So this is not how I would collect data when doing an assessment, but was more um, a desire to be able to keep the meter uh, in focus and give some sense of the ambience of what's going on. So what we're going to do here in just a moment, we're going to look at a video and when we uh, start the video, we're going to go through the two doorways, and you'll be able to see the new millimeter wave product. You'll see the light on the top going from a, a safer to a less safe area from left to right, as well as the numbers um, climbing as well. And uh, you'll be able to hear the meter as well. So. Let's go ahead and, and uh, see if this works here.
Is there sound, Keith? Because we're not hearing it. Okay, so I hope that audio was was reasonable. We uh, didn't hear any audio. Oh well, I apologize for that. Uh, I'll get I'll get this posted online so you can you can uh, take a listen at your leisure. Thank you. All right, so here's what you can do to minimize personal exposure. So number one would be shop elsewhere. If you're able to find a um, a reseller, uh, a grocery store that has manually operated doors, you might consider shopping there. I found one store, one supermarket that had a um, a door that you could push and enter. It, it was for the delicatessen, but you could access the entire store from there. And it did not have this, you know, millimeter wave feature. So maybe there'd be a store near you where that is a possibility. You may want to consider home delivery or curb delivery as a way of avoiding this exposure. And if you must enter a millimeter wave controlled portal, you might want to not spend unnecessary time before, between, or after the doors. In particular, you know, between the, the inner and the outer doors. I notice a lot of stores will have a bench there. It's probably not a, not a good place to wait for somebody. Um, you might want to move away quickly from the door safely and avoid spending time near the doors and... Also, I found that the checkout stands in some of the stores that were nearest the doors had a uh, a considerable amount of millimeter wave exposure. So that's grocery stores and some ideas for avoiding. Rob talked about the um, the vehicular radar systems and the fact that they emit millimeter wave RF radiation as well. They early ones seem to emit maybe just in the back. And then as things evolved, we're seeing emissions from the front and the back and both sides as well. So there's a um, picture of a truck and the telltale signs of millimeter wave emitters. You can, you can see them usually in the back of the vehicle. Sometimes you'll see them in the front of the vehicle and some vehicles have no indication whatsoever of the emitters. So you can't really go by whether you see those little dots in order to determine whether there's millimeter wave exposure. So I think virtually everyone in the population, um, just like shopping and going in and buying something to eat, is going to be frequenting the byways if only as a pedestrian or somebody shopping, um, if not driving. The problem is that the new conveniences in automobiles are being powered by this millimeter wave technology. So depending on the model, this may involve, as I say, emissions from the front, rear, and both sides. So circles illustrate the um, millimeter wave emitters on this vehicle. This is a test report. It's for a 2020 Lincoln Nautilus. And you can see the highlighted information there that it's emissions, intentional emissions, in the range between 22 and 24 gigahertz. This is a license-exempt ISM band, I believe. And it's a fairly easy process. Rob outlined one way is to look in the, the owner's manual. I actually, my son had a friend who had an older vehicle and they did not have the FCC data, for example. So with that vehicle, which was a 20, 2010 um, Ford Fusion, what I was able to do was 
look at the term, the terminology that they were using and the terminology that was used in, in that vehicle was reverse sensing system. And then using that information, I did a uh, search online with the model number of the car, and I quickly was able to find the replacement module. And they're very inexpensive, by the way, and you can get them on eBay and other places. But once you have the, um, the part that is installed, you can go backwards and sort of get the FCC or other agency information about it. So are these systems and, and the like contributing to um, the difficulty myself and my clients are feeling? Uh, and it's already been mentioned that the millimeter waves easily pass through glass and enter adjacent vehicles. So some of the uh, conveniences are being marketed as adaptive cruise control, collision avoidance, automatic emergency braking, reverse sensing system. And um, this all seems to be part of the intelligent transportation system vision. So, you know, I guess my questions would be whether the convenience of some of these things is worth exposing everyone to millimeter wave RF. We've lived a long time without it. Is it worth potential harm? And the same comment about the potential for losing an epidemiological um, signal, if you will. So we're going to have another video here. We've got my ridiculous, uh, not very portable camera set up. I can't tell you how many hours I spent trying to get video of cars going by with the meter in focus and with the cars in focus. So uh, this is the best I could do. And uh, anyway, what, what you're going to see in and here, it's a short clip, but it's vehicles going by that have the radar capability and you'll be able to see activity on the meter and yeah so we're going to take a look at that next All right. I'm just curious. Was the audio better on that one or no? We, we could hear that. Yes. And you could see the the LEDs go from green to yellow, orange. Yeah. 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 And I just want to reemphasize that that's not the way I would take meter readings. And that antenna was actually in completely the wrong orientation. So the actual signal strength of those sources was much greater than the camera setup would have indicated. So... The findings are, you know, commonly found exposures in the extreme range greater than a thousand microwatts per square meter emissions from all sides that the middle, middle meteor wave easily penetrates glass. And it's, it was not difficult for me to acquire readings from between 20 and 50 feet uh, distance. So the implications, um, Obviously, the byways or roadways and highways are now being contaminated with millimeter wave radiation and untreated window glass provides no protection, but there are other concerns as well. So let's take a look. My wife and my favorite restaurant, um, it makes me sick every time I go there <laughs> because of the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth based music system and customer cell phones and whatnot. But we still go there with regularity. You know, we'd love to go there once a, once a week if we can. And living in a shielded home, um, I've gained resilience, so it gets easier and easier as time goes by. But we go, we go there regularly because we love the owner and their family and the food is nourishing and whatnot. But now, I believe I know why we had, even before I'd received this meter, we'd, we had given up the sidewalk dining and we had retreated back into the restaurant. So I... I believe the additional millimeter wave radiation exposure from the passing automobiles was making me that much uh, sicker, that much faster. So the 
point is that knowing where the dangers are helps to avoid the dangers. Residences adjacent to roadways will be affected if they have untreated glass uh, facing the roadway. And of course, car travel is, is now problematic. The more cars, the more of this type of radiation. So survival tactics here, it's a bit, a bit more difficult. I would say carefully consider whether you want a vehicle, whether you want to invest in and support an industry that puts this in their vehicles. Uh, avoid traveling in vehicles with radar. Avoid, although just because your vehicle doesn't have radar doesn't mean you won't get it from the other vehicles around. Avoid sidewalk dining, avoid uh, living arrangements near roadways. And as an extreme measure, you know, speak to your trusted EMF resource in your area about vehicular shielding. And, and Rob alluded to that. So I hope this has been helpful. I want to thank you, Rob, for allowing me to participate in this event. And I'll turn it back over to you now. Okay, great, Keith. Thanks for that uh, succinct and uh, great presentation. And you know, thanks for all your your detective work with the millimeter wave meter. And you know, thanks for sharing those discoveries. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking to for people to get out there and start measuring these millimeter waves. And you know, I think we're going to get a lot of surprises. Um, they're going to be in places we don't expect them. And even though in Canada, we, we technically don't have millimeter waves transmitting um, um, in the cellular band, you know, I, they, they, they could be testing, they could be out there still. So we need to go through and, and do some hunting and discovering and seeing what's really out there. But uh, thank you again, Keith. And um, now I will, uh, this gentleman almost needs no introduction, but I will give him an introduction. Uh, um, one of my building biology colleagues and good friends, Orm Miller um, from uh, Los Angeles, California, will now present uh, some discoveries he's found with uh, um, 5G millimeter cellular uh, radiation. So Orm, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Rob. And thanks to all of the presenters that we've seen uh, very uh, illuminating and informative. Uh, so I will start sharing the screen here and I will now start uh, the slideshow here. There we go. All right. So um, sorry, Orm, before you start, just a, just a quick note. Uh, we are doing Q and A at the end. So uh, please stick around. Um, we'll let uh, Orm finish his presentation and then we'll, we'll, we'll stay on as long as we need. Hopefully it won't be too long, but uh, we'll stay as long as we need to get everyone's questions answered. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and I will, uh, um, in the interest of time, I know it's getting uh, long uh, or late here. I, I will, um, so I will uh, go through this quickly. Um, the slides that I prepared here, uh, some of them are repeat videos. I, I may not even show some of them. Um, this slide presentation, I know for, for a fact uh, and others, uh, will be available from Tony and the Safe Living Technologies team on their website at safelivingtechnologies.org, uh, .com, excuse me. And then you click on education and then there's a drop down menu. And the first item there is MM Wave Learning. Click on that and there will be a link in there to these slides. Um, and and the, uh, what uh, Tony uh, and his staff, and Elizabeth have been doing is grouping together like Rob's slides and then my slides. I will also have these slides available on my website, which is at the bottom of this slide, createhealthyhomes.com. Uh, and uh, so this afternoon, I'll get them up there so you can go through this. Because So here we go. Um, one second. Let me admit that person. Okay. So now... Um, so uh, this is... Re sorry to, to interrupt, Oren, but your... Um, the... Um... The screen sharing, um, uh, the status bar is is blocking some of the presentation. There. Uh, if you could elevate that up a little bit. All right. Um, I'm going to try and do that, Rob. Let's see. Now that's interesting because my hmm. I'm going to try and let, raise it up, but I can't grab. Oh, there we go. Now I can see my there. Uh, sorry that that's there. You guys can see that, hmm? Darn. 
Huh. All right. Well, all right. In any event. Um, okay. So I'm hitting the, uh, the, the forward and back key, which has worked in the past. Oh, sorry. Um, but it's not working here. So let me stop the share and uh, get out of this uh, and enter again. Sorry. One second here. All right. <clears throat> All right, here we go. <clears throat> so today's presentation will contain a synopsis of what I've shown you in the uh, first two um, learning sessions. Um, I've been a beta tester since early June. Um, and just in summary, most millimeter wave antennas that I have found are on busy boulevards, mostly from Verizon, but not always. And I'll show you a non-Verizon one uh, today. Uh, I have also noted 4G, LTE, and uh, Verizon low band uh, antennas. And let me let this person in. Oh, I wish my cursor would show up. Shoot, okay. Um, and then uh, these findings are a snapshot in time in one location, and we look forward to input from our colleagues, which we're now uh, receiving. So I'm not gonna go over this slide. I, I went over this uh, the first time that I showed, but, but uh, come back, look at these slides and just review this material because this shows a synopsis of the low band uh, offerings by for 4G and 5G by the three major carriers in the United States, Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT&T, the mid band offerings, and then the high band or millimeter wave band, which is what's measured with the uh, blue millimeter wave meter. Uh, and that is primarily Verizon, but there is uh, some service in urban areas by AT&T and T-Mobile as well. Uh, and I just want to show you that the 4G is primarily from six or 700 megahertz to 1000 uh, megahertz or one gigahertz as um, uh, Magna mentioned earlier. Uh, and then the mid band is from one to six uh, gigahertz. Uh, and this is all the 4G uh, uh, real estate. And then uh, you have mid band in the three to four megahertz range. So the high band, the millimeter wave band starts 20 gigahertz and, and above from there. And again, the download speeds are in the hundreds of megahertz, uh, megabits per second when you get up into the mid-band uh, 5G uh, coverage and connection. And then the millimeter wave is uh, in the, uh, well, actually this is showing millimeter wave um, average download speeds a couple of years ago from AT&T and T-Mobile in the um, 250, 280 megabits per second range. Verizon is 600 and, and higher uh, for the millimeter wave service. Uh, but it turns out that the average time spent on millimeter wave uh, uh, connection, connectivity, is still in the, just a handful of percentage. Uh, as of two years ago, it was only 1% of all cellular activity. And then you'll see here on this screen, uh, looking on the far right, that grouping uh, of the four companies, USA Cellular is in the Midwest and uh, some of the East Coast, uh, Mid-Atlantic states. Um, it's, you know, three, four percent in urban areas, uh, the red at the bottom, that's the millimeter wave coverage. So it's not as extensive as we think, not yet. Um, and then the uh, blue, the, the yellow, excuse me, is all uh, 5G. That would mean the low band nationwide 5G, which is not being formed. The mid band 5G, which may be being formed, can be down to two gigahertz. I don't know how much of the C band or if any is being formed. We're going to find that out when I speak with the uh, technicians at uh, the booths at the, um, the 5G conference that I'm going to in September. So beamform signals are, this is this is the details, and I updated this this morning from what, from the screen, this same screen uh, or slide uh, a few weeks ago. So beamform signals are still on demand as they initially were since the early years of 5G, that means five years ago, starting in 2018. Currently measured millimeter wave antenna beacon signals are now always on. Um, and uh, the, the beacon signals five years ago for the first few years of the uh, 5G um, activity from the cell carriers, the, the beacon signals were uh, uh, for a, a few milliseconds or nanoseconds, literally a few times per second. Uh, and they were very weak. They were minus 60, minus 70 
decibels per meter, um, which is equivalent, and this came up in the chat, to 0 0.001 microwatt per meter squared or 0 0.01. But now this, this, this activity that we're measuring for the last few weeks, which has been present for perhaps for a year, we don't know, um, is perhaps the beacon signal. I need to find out more about this. And because there's now a uh, higher and more uh, strong with higher uh, power densities as measured with the safe and sound millimeter wave meter, when that gets triggered, as you'll see, and as I showed um, the last time that we met. So these be millimeter wave beacon signals is consistent in power flux density uh, from side to side across the full 120 degree wide transmission, This these beacon signals. And they're just like 4G and low and mid band 5G in that regard. And then the power density of the millimeter wave beacon signal that gets triggered by data activity on your phone, if you have this, if your phone matches the uh, the company, if your phone, your carrier matches the carrier that put in the, the millimeter wave antenna that's in front of you, then that gets triggered. And that, that beamform signal is significantly, um, it's still less than the 4G uh, signals that uh, are there uh, at the same distance. And I, I'll show you that in one of the slides. So I measure generally only 100 to 1,000, maybe a little bit stronger uh, microwatts per meter squared uh, with both the stub and the horn antennas on the safe and sound pro a meter uh, versus you know easily 10,000 to a quarter of a million at the same distance from the 4G antenna that was in the same um, uh, antenna, our same location. Millimeter wave beacon signals dissipate quickly with distance were not measured beyond a half to one full city block as I walked away. Um, and then again, you compare that to 4G and low and uh, mid-band 5G that travel at higher power densities for a mile or more. Um, I'm not measuring millimeter wave 5G signals in residential and suburban neighborhoods. I found one example of that, but generally otherwise, if there is a uh, cell antenna, it's usually uh, mid-band 5G or low to mid-band 4G. And finally, mi millimeter wave 5G signals are so far confined to main boulevards with foot traffic and commercial and apartment buildings. So it's primarily an outdoor phenomenon. It's not a coverage spectrum. Uh, the industry doesn't consider it to be a coverage spectrum, um, not the millimeter wave service. It's supplemental. It's very high speed. It, it doesn't penetrate through walls. So it's really for out, people who are outside and in public places where they put these millimeter wave transmitters in the um, ceilings of convention centers, airports, metro stops, uh, and, and uh, so on. Uh, so it does not penetrate buildings, building walls well. Shielding would be highly effective when used, provided that it's solid. Um, and uh, we'll get into that. We'll see that lower down here. Millimeter waves do penetrate low E glass, approximately 50 to 70%. Uh, film could be effective on windows because it's it's relatively uniform. Um, metal mesh screen and RF curtains are less so due to holes that the millimeter waves can pass through. The beacon signals were not dependent upon what my phone was doing. Um, the Verizon millimeter wave antenna beacon signal is present uh, whether my Verizon phone, uh, iPhone had the 5G enabled um, or disabled. Um, let's see, sorry. Uh, Bruce, are you able to, are you still co-host? Because I can't admit, uh, Kevin, he wants to get in here. I'll have to stop the screen share in order to do that. Gosh, I just don't have the, um, let me try this. There we go. Okay. Uh, now, let's see, I have to go back to play this. There we go. Okay, um, so the, the Verizon millimeter wave antenna beacon signal was present whether the iPhone that I had had the 5G enabled, disabled, or in airplane mode. The beacon signal was not strong, uh, as I mentioned, in the early uh, years of 5G. I already covered that. My Verizon iPhone did trigger the beamform signal uh, and it emitted uh, the levels, my iPhone, admitted levels uh, that I measured on the safe and sound pro meter, millimeter wave meter of greater than half a million, only when engaged in data activity that, that then triggered the connection or the beamform signal from the antenna to my phone. And then my phone sent out a very strong signal as well. So the millimeter wave 5G signals from the Verizon iPhone are not present when my iPhone was not near 
a millimeter wave antenna. And you can also disable the 5G capacity or function on your phone. Only phones from the same carrier that installed the millimeter wave antenna will have uh, five trans 5G transmissions from the phone turned on by that antenna. So I hope you all understand what I'm saying here. So if I was in front of it, and I sh I'll show you this in, in a uh, video, when I'm in front of a, uh, with my Verizon iPhone 14, when I'm in front of a millimeter wave antenna that I confirmed is a millimeter wave antenna, but from an AT&T uh, or T-Mobile uh, antenna, uh, that did not, my phone and data uh, activity did not trigger that beamform signal. So I did measure higher millimeter wave readings on my millimeter wave RF meter when passersby walked by, presumably with their Verizon cell phone triggered by the Verizon antenna that I was in front of. And uh, these high RF levels from cell phones may be strong, a stronger health threat to the user um, and to those standing nearby than actual millimeter wave signals from the 5G antenna. Sorry, I have to let this person in. There we go. Uh, and the millimeter wave signals from the 5G antenna are beam formed. Um, we do not know if the RF signals from the cell phone triggered by the millimeter wave antenna are also beam formed from the cell phone. That I will um, look into when I go to the conference next month. So considering that you will all likely not see millimeter wave signals in uh, residential areas, but the millimeter wave antenna is still valuable for, re particularly for those of us who are practitioners for reassuring clients that they do not have this dreaded 5G, which uh, in this case would be the, the millimeter wave uh, signals outside their home. And they're greatly relieved by that uh, knowledge. So I, I do use this uh, meter, the millimeter wave meter outside of every home I go to I'm the clients often there with me and I'll show them what the levels are with the green meter in, in the low and mid band uh, range and, and there is activity, but then I turn on the millimeter wave antenna and it shows generally not much, not activity in the residential areas and they're, they're happy about that. You will also see where millimeter wave service does exist in urban areas. And there are pe many people who live in urban areas and they often have a problem uh, as uh, Magda mentioned. And, um, but in this person here, um, and you know there are there are clients who live in these urban areas and they are uh, at risk. I showed you that in the videos in the the first uh, session that we had in late June. Uh, also, you can show how strong and pervasive the four G LTE and low to mid band five G is with your pro safe and sound pro meter and other RF meters in common use and uh, the gigahertz solutions models that we use in our profession. And you can also show how strong the RF levels are from the portable wireless devices that many people have in their personal space and they're not aware of that, including EHS people, electrically hypersensitive people who are our clients who are really focusing because on the 5G, uh, the millimeter wave 5G outside their homes, because that's all they're reading about. Uh, and then, so I'm gonna go over conclusions again by Mitch Marshawn uh, when he met with me in July, early July, and we showed those videos. Beam form signals are fairly significant from the millimeter wave antennas. We have three separate effects when in proximity to these antennas. Number one, a 24 seven background level across the cone, 120 degrees wide, which I'm now calling a beacon signal. We'll find out more next month what that is from the uh, trade show. Um, sorry, let's put this person in, there we go. Uh, the number two, the uh, the phone, if you have the same phone as the carrier that put the antenna in place, will trigger a beamform signal from that antenna to where you are. It, it can buy a geolocate you in front of it. Um, and it's a spotlight. Uh, that was the term that Mitch used to the phone or tablet three to four feet wide. And the meter read, uh, well, it maxed out at 31,000 microwatts. Now you can put the attenuator on and then retest. That's what the uh, or an antenna. At the same time, Mitch and I found that the background exposure level across the full cone elevates slightly as well for everyone else, maybe 100 microwatts or so from what it was. It could be a six, 800, 1,000 microwatts. It goes up about 100 when someone is getting a beamform signal directly to where they are. Uh, so con uh, 
continuing on with the conclusions from both of us, the beamform signal is fairly significant from the millimeter wave antenna triggered by phones from the same cell carrier, as I mentioned. Three separate effects in proximity. I just mentioned those in the previous slide. Millimeter, millimeter wave antennas are still rare in residential neighborhoods. That's what I've found so far. Uh, millimeter wave signals are blocked by solid walls. Uh, uh, yes, by, by, by walls uh, and then by solid shielding materials, including foil and paint. And they're not blocked as well. Uh, the millimeter wave signals are not blocked as well by uh, glass. I mentioned that earlier. And I showed you that in a video in the first uh, learning session in late June, nor by fabric or mesh because of the holes in them. Whereas all of these things uh, do block the low and mid band uh, signals because they have a much uh, longer wavelength of you know, 12 to 15 inches in, in, in 6, 700, 800, 900 megahertz. Uh, frequency range called the, the low band, mid band, you know, 1800, 1900, 20, uh, 21, 2500. Those were around uh, five to seven inches and even three inches when you get up into the mid band. So there's a big difference. Um, and these shielding materials do block them better, uh, even the um, fabric and the mesh screen than in the millimeter wave uh, signals. So recommendations for further testing, uh, use your cell phone for this, uh, from the same cell carrier if you want to, uh, to see this in action as a tester, uh, as the millimeter wave antenna to trigger a beamform signal. So you might wanna get a, a phone from Verizon, whether that's the one you use for your personal use. Um, you may have been a T-Mobile or AT&T customer for years and don't wanna switch, but you might need to still get another Verizon phone for testing purposes to turn this on. So you can see that phenomenon when you're, when you're testing uh, because Verizon predominates the millimeter wave 5G service in the US. Um, use your attenuator when measuring with the horn antenna as a signal from the antenna and the phone will exceed the rated capacity for the ant horn antenna, which is 31,000 microwatts. And notice an you'll notice an increase in the average values and let me let this person in. This is something that Mitch Marshawn mentioned, which was very interesting. Um, he said the average uh, setting, which we've all had for years on the Safe and Sound Pro uh, meter, which I haven't really paid attention to, but he said, you'll see more activity with a millimeter wave meter on the average setting, because that means that there's uh, less downtime or, or gaps or times which could only last for a, a second or two where there's no activity. In other words, the, these beat, these signals, these pulse signals, especially when the beam forming is going on, they're much more packed together and you'll see a higher reading in the average. And that, that uh, explains that as an interesting finding. So this is what these look like. Um, uh, you can see there, this is from the very first uh, group of slides that I presented in late June. Uh, that those are three, millimeter wave antennas uh, pointing in um, three different directions, covering 120 degrees between them um, for relatively full coverage in all directions. Uh, and now uh, here is the, uh, this is a video. We also know that this is a 4G installation. Sorry. Because here we are nope. at Alta Avenue and 19th Street in Santa Monica. And this is the first 5G millimeter wave installation that I've seen in the residential neighborhood here deep within the residential neighborhood, which is the lower part there. And then above that is a 4G or low band 5G installation. Um, but I Sorry, darn, okay, I had to let that person in, but that stopped the video. So um, I'm going to uh, skip this in the interest of time, go on to the next slide. Uh, and you can watch this in the um, uh, when you click on the slides. Let's see here. We also know that this is a 4G installation. So here we are. Because well, guys, Avenue I'm so and sorry. Street in Santa Monica, and this is the. There we go. Uh, and again, in the interest of time, this is a, a video that I showed in the previous uh, uh, slide deck uh, in Ju July. So I'll let you go back and listen to that. So my conclusion. Is sorry. Uh, and the same thing with these summaries by Mitch Marsh on here. Uh, I'm gonna, so you want to summarize what you, uh, because we just don't have enough time. Another to go summary through again. Yeah. But I want to get to. Well, there's the. So we are, 
Okay, this is this is something that I need to, to show. So now we're just gonna look at, we have two millimeter wave with both with the horn antennas. And one's gonna be measuring what's coming from the antenna. The other one's gonna be measuring what's coming from the phone. So Orem's gonna hit the go button on the speed test. And what we'll see is... And it goes from 5G to when this kicks on, you'll see the UW appear. One second. There we go. So about 31,000 on the top one, about 2,000, 4,000, 7,000, depending how we hold it. 7,000. Look at that speed. And the, uh, there's no change in the sound for the upload or download. Yeah. The, the upload seems to be a little bit less of a... And now we're just back down to, now the speed test is done. But we went up to about a thousand on the upload. I'm not sure if that was just in a, how I was holding the meters, um, but it was 7,000 on the download on, on this upper one. Uh, so it seemed to be a little bit less on the upload, uh, but this one stayed about the same regardless, stayed about the 31,000. Coming from the phone? From the phone. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted you to hear, see and hear that. So first of all, because there's a Verizon 5G millimeter wave antenna off in the distance there, um, and I have a Verizon iPhone, when I uh, initiated an, some activity in the data mode, which was to turn on speed tests, or you could uh, listen to an internet radio or, or download a video um, and, and, and play stream something in live uh, uh, time, you would be activating the beamform signal from that antenna off in the distance to your phone. Uh, and what Mitch said in, in, in the summary uh, is that it's, it's a three to four foot uh, beam that's right around you. Uh, and it, then it raises the millimeter wave uh, level a little bit uh, in, in the whole cone that's 120 degrees from side to side. But the point is, um, so the beamform signal came right at me and at the phone. Uh, and I got a speed uh, test sig uh, uh, speed. Uh, you can see it on the screen there, 2,600 megabits per second, which is incredibly fast. Uh, and then the, uh, and you heard the sound. You heard an, uh, a higher sound uh, come from that, um, uh, that that was over and above the, uh, the, the background beacon signal. So let's go to the next slide here now, if I can do that. So now we're just going to... Sorry, here it is. This is a new slide that I just took yesterday. So let's let, let's uh, listen to this video. So it's August 14th, 2023, and we're on the corner of Westgate and Gorham uh, Avenues here in uh, West Los Angeles. Uh, and what you're seeing here are 4G and uh, millimeter wave 5G antennas. The 4G, I don't know how many there are, there are two or three in the cylinder at the very top. And then there are three millimeter wave 5G antennas one pointing over my right shoulder, uh, the other two are pointing diagonally to the far left and far right, uh, 120 degrees out of phase with each other. So I'm going to show you um, something that I noticed about this in the next video. So here's what I found. First of all, when I turn on my Safe and Sound Pro 2 uh, meter, which measures between 200 megahertz and 8 to 10 gigahertz, that's the sound, you can hear that, of the 4G signal that's coming from the 4G antennas at the top, and perhaps mid-band, 5G. Um, and we're getting about 7,000 microwatts per meter squared here. So I'm gonna turn that off, and now I'm going to turn on the uh, millimeter wave uh, meter, which is in my other pocket here, coming right up. And this one, is with the stub antenna, and you'll hear the sound of the, uh, what we believe is the beacon signal coming out of this. And I do not believe that this is a Verizon uh, 5G antenna, unlike the ones that are in Santa Monica, not far from here, that I've showed you in other videos. I can stop it now. So now I have the safe and sound uh, millimeter wave meter here, and I'm going to turn on the... Uh, the sound. I'm going to clear it. And we have about 1,200 and I got 2,000 
microwatts per meter squared. So this is clearly a millimeter wave antenna, but it's not Verizon. And how do I know that? Because on my Verizon phone here, it says LTE. It does not say 5G or UW, which is ultra wideband. The other thing I want to show you, sorry, that might've gone off. See the LTE in the upper right corner. Now I'm going to uh, turn on speed test. And remember when I did a speed test in front of a Verizon tower, it turned on the beamformed 5G, which did not have, has not happened with this. And I'll show you that now. And also it was 2,300 or 2,600 uh, megabits per second download speed, but that's not what's happening here. So, all right, here we go. I'm going to turn this on, turn on the sound, clear this. And this is uh, measuring 380 microwatts per meter squared. Listen as I start this. Connecting. And it's, it's started. Now, when we were doing this before, it would turn on the beamform signal from the Verizon 5G antenna. That's not happening here. And the speed test is only 278 um, megabits per second download speed. That's from 4G, uh, from another Verizon cell tower. That could be Verizon, but it could be AT&T or T-Mobile. I don't know. And then 24 megabits per second upload speed. So the point is, turn the sound off here. The point is, um, if you are not a customer of the 5G millimeter wave antenna, it's not going to trigger a beamform signal to you and to the phone that you're carrying. That's the point. Thank you. Okay, so I hope you all understood what I was uh, doing there uh, in, the, in that last slide, uh, that the uh, you only trigger that beamform signal to come to where you are, to your your phone, if your phone is the same company as the, the, the same carrier as the millimeter wave uh, antenna. Now I knew it was a millimeter wave antenna because this was active. You know, the meter was active. The meter was showing the signal. Does that make sense to everyone? But it's not Verizon because, uh, you know, it, it, it said LTE, not 5G. But even if it one earlier, some of the Verizon 5G antennas said LTE until I did some date, something with data like turning on speed test and then the 5G came on, you know, and then when it, when it actually started connected and actually started uh, uh, when it turned on the beamform signal, then the UW ultra wideband showed up as well. Um, and then you heard the sound, uh, in, uh, the added sound, and then the, the number went up on this. Whereas that uh, two, 300, 270 something megabits per uh, microwatts per meter squared, never rose on this when, when the speed test was happening with this at that very last example. Very confusing, a lot of detail, and I hope that it made sense to you all. So Rob and Tony, at this point, that's I'm done with my presentation. So we're all the presenters are done. Uh, it's two hours and 20 minutes, but we'll definitely open it up for questions. So um, Rob, I'll take it away. And you're on mute right now. Thanks, Aurum. Um, and yeah, we we still need to measure. Like we've we basically understand the Verizon system fairly well now. I think um, so. Yeah, we need to test other carriers. We need to test other locations, you know, across the U.S. and Canada. We need to test other countries to see if there's any differences between what Aurum's results are and what others will find. So that that needs to be done. And we encourage all of you to do that. And um, yeah, I think we should uh, go to uh, any questions we can, um, any questions that are left in the forum or the chat. Well, we can uh, there's 50 more that came on while I was doing my presentation, which I wasn't able to look at, of course. Uh, now you can do what Lori's done. She raised her hands. So Lori, unmute yourself uh, and go ahead and ask your question. Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've been wondering if uh, anyone has tested the inside of the car that has radar to see if its own radar is affecting the passengers or the driver inside the car. When I was doing it, I did find some slight readings inside the vehicle. Yes. Um, I'd say they were 
maybe 20%, 10% of what I was getting outside, um, maybe even a little less, but I did pick something up inside the car. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Thanks, Lori. Charlene, oh, you're next. Yeah, or Rob, oh, yes, Tony. I was just going to ask Rob, do you think that uh, that was bleeding in from the outside or do you think it's actually generating on the inside? That's hard to say. That needs more testing. Yeah, I didn't I didn't focus on that this time, but maybe maybe I could do some more testing on that. Can I add something? Um, I did just read in my Subaru manual something about the radar only operating when the car is moving over six miles per hour. Right. See, that's the that's a different transmitter, I believe. That's going to be coming out the front, and that's the adaptive cruise control. And that is going to be at the 76 gigahertz range, I think. So um, we don't have a meter to measure that at this point in time. Um, and I've tried to measure it with the guys at, at the shop. And we actually, yeah, we had to accelerate to 30 kilometers an hour. And I had them standing in front of the car trying to measure, and we didn't pick anything up. So I'm assuming it's a 76 gigahertz radar signal coming out the front. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, does, does that answer your question, Darlene? No, that was my question. Okay, you're good? My question was about the um, protective clothing that you can buy. Um, are we making ourselves, uh, like, are, is there, radiation being induced into the fabric? Is that a bad idea to wear those things? Well, different types of fabric are made differently and it all depends on the type of fabric that you have. But um, yeah, the, just the general rule of thumb, if you're wearing shielding clothing, you, you don't really want it to come in direct contact with your skin. Um, for one thing, a lot of them have me metallic coatings that you know can transfer off onto your skin. And another reason, is if there's a field on these on these uh, shielding fabrics and you're in contact with them, there's a very good chance that that field can transfer over to you anyways. So we like to see different layers of protection. You know, if you have a shielding fabric, um, you definitely want to insulate it from touching the body. Um, from from my point of view and many electrically sensitive uh, persons' points of view as well. So um, those are the, the kind of the caveats and. Um, yeah, you just have to look at the shielding specifications for each material that you're using to see that it shields up to 40 gig and what the shielding effectiveness is of the materials at that frequency as well. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not understanding. Shielding at 40 Very blessed to be out here because it is a fairly EMF free zone and part of the reason why we chose to live out here. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, go ahead, Darlene. Sorry, um, the, the last part of that conversation let me make sure it's really 40 at I'm least cutting 40. in and out i'm sorry oh, i didn't pick that up warm did you hear that she she um um darlene your your audio is cutting in and out oh can you hear me now uh, yeah try your try your, your last question again last part i i missed part of the conversation where you said it has to be at least 40 40 what the shielding capability? Rob, 40 meters was it? Gigahertz. Or? 40 gigahertz. And what kind of what kind of um you know are you saying like just to wear a cotton shirt underneath, or do we need to wear something more than that so that the fabric would not touch the skin? Um yeah, if you if you want to just make sure you're isolated from that piece of shielding material somehow. Mm -hmm. Um you could try just a cotton t-shirt, but if it got if it got sweaty or wet, um, yeah. that would get you in contact with the shielding material. So perhaps something a little um, that gets the, the material away from you a little bit more, something thicker, perhaps, um, maybe one or two layers. Okay. But um, yeah, then the number was 40 gigahertz. You wanted to you want to check the shielding effectiveness of shielding material, you know, at least a 24 or 30 gigahertz because um, that's what we're measuring with, with the meter now and what Orem's measuring with, with Verizon, but it could potentially be coming in at 39 gigahertz as well too. So, um, you know, those are the 40 gigahertz is the important number there, I think. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Darlene. Um, there was a question uh, by someone. Uh, she says, do I understand well that it is not that we're not sure whether beamforming also takes place with a 5G enabled smartphone when the millimeter waves are not present? What I was talking about was um, the, the measuring that I was doing with the meter uh, from my Verizon iPhone. I only got uh, the, the, the 5G, you know, half a million uh, strong uh, radio signal from this when the beam forming was going on. When I was in front of a Verizon millimeter wave antenna that I could, and, and I knew that because I could see the activity on this and the 5G and especially the UW came on when I uh, did something with data like speedtest.net or, uh, you know, downloading some, something on the internet or uh, streaming uh, audio or video, uh, then, then they, it would be very strong, but I don't know if that's beam formed. We don't know that from this meter. I'm going to ask that of the, um, uh, the antenna manufacturers and, and the, the Verizon folks at the, uh, the conference I'm going to go to. So that's, that's as much as we know. Uh, Stephen Lawrence, you have your, your next. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, it seems like we're we're going about trying to kind of uh, reverse engineer some of this technology, and I was just curious if it's if it's been done yet, where someone has gone through all the patents and tried to look up these technologies, and there's got to be patents out there for all of this, and uh, try to understand through the patents how these technologies work. Well, that's what I'm trying to do, and and, and uh, yeah, what what you can all do, those of you who are inclined to do this, is a attend these uh 5g conferences there's a similar one a much smaller one uh in um uh, brooklyn that's held uh, a 5g conference uh that that i saw in a nice 5g write-up on the uh, techwellness.com website from a colleague of mine a client of mine and colleague here in southern california bryce august um and uh, she has a link to that and so there's the mobile world congress La las vegas conference in the third week of September for two and a half days that that anyone can well anyone can go to it's, it's open um, there is a, a a fee to get in a couple hundred hours uh, anyway uh, so uh, then there are also webinars that you can watch for free from Rode and Schwartz and uh, um, then uh, the uh, Qualcomm and, and some of these other uh, uh, software companies and uh, uh, other companies, Fierce Wireless. You know, I, I have those links in my 5G article at createhealthyhomes.com, go to education and then 5G, and then scroll down. You'll see links to these these resources from the, the industry itself. And they have webinars and you just sign up and 90% and of it will go over your head, but you'll you'll glean some of it. And I, I can follow it for the most part. You just have to know what the acronyms mean. Uh, and then you'll understand what, what's going on with the technology. Okay. So anyway, uh, James Costa, you're next. But, but good point, um, Stephen. James, you're next. Go ahead and unmute. Your, yeah, there you are. Unmute yourself. And what's your question, uh, sir? Sorry about that. Thank you all. Um, it's been uh, been a while. I got the opportunity and the, the pleasure to talk to you, Oram, uh, Quite an extensive conversation we had a while back on your way to a job one time. Okay, thanks, James. So thank you for the all the help. But uh, and I had a couple things here, but I'm going to make it try to make it real quick to be respectful of time. First of all, I missed the first part of this. Is there uh, is there going to be a replay of this? Recording? Tony, you want to speak to that? Uh, yes, there will be a replay, and um, we will be sending out a link to everyone so they will uh, have the opportunity to watch it from start to finish. Awesome, awesome. And, and also, just uh, make note, uh, uh, www.safelivingtechnologies.com. Then on their menu bar, you'll see education over on the right. And when you hover your mouse there, the drop-down menu will appear. Mill MM Wave, millimeter wave learning is the first entry. You click on that. That takes you to the page that that you typed in your name and address to get the Zoom invitation for this conference. Uh, and Rob's gonna show it to us. Um, and then if you scroll down on that same page, you will see um, 
uh, there will be links. There are links there to the previous two uh, learning sessions, millimeter wave learning sessions. There, right there. You see where it says education? And yep. there's the millimeter. Okay. Now, when you click on that, that now this will be changed by Tony later today because this event, but, but there, there are the links for the previous, see in July and then the one on June 28th. And then also you see there the down, download the, um, go up just a little bit, Rob. Yeah, download the slides uh, and so on. So all of those links are there. And and what uh, what the staff has done is to take like, Rob's slides will be first, my slides will be right after them in one big PDF, okay? So, but the replay, the link to the replay of this meeting will be right there uh, sure. within sure. a day or so. Tony's gonna put that together and, and his colleagues. Beautiful, Thank beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, uh, I did get, I don't, I haven't had a cell phone in over 25 years or Wi-Fi or any of that stuff. So I, I live in a, basically in a Faraday, a 2000 square foot Faraday cage. Um, got uh, opportunity to spend about an hour with Dr. Martin Paul here in Bandon, Oregon a few years ago. And, um, he gave me some good tips about the 5G uh what he knew at that time and i have in back of me here i have uh on the wall this i'm sure you folks most of you are familiar with this this radiant barrier i used to sell this 30 years ago uh for insulation and that's what it's in this is my production room here that's what's what it's in here for is insulation but <clears throat> orm was talking about the the holes in Mar dr martin paul uh, did as well uh, he told me about the way to shield my skylights in here. And because of the the uh, millimeter wave is so small, you need a very, very fine um, mesh stainless screen or, you know, screen. Um, so I guess this radiant barrier is good for great insulation. It's amazing, but it's not really good from what I'm hearing Orm talk about and Dr. Paul, uh, it's not really good for 5G um, because of the holes. There's holes every half inch in this insulation. And, and, and James, when you say 5G, we all have to really specify, are we talking about oh, high band right. 5G, millimeter wave band, low, right. mid band, low band? The physics are different because right. of the wavelengths. Mm -hmm. The frequencies are different. And when the frequencies differ, the wavelengths differ. And when the wavelengths differ, the, the, the characteristics or, or what's possible for penetration, for distance and for shielding it's all different depending yep. on what band yeah go, so go ahead got it yep 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 i yeah, got it james that. it all depends on the size of the holes too so um, yeah and the distance they're apart maybe um so now that we have the millimeter wave meter like that would be a good a good thing to test with the meter as well just to, if you had a source yeah stick it in between the source and the meter and see uh see if there's any leakage through because Aluminum foil, there should be should be nothing that comes through. It's almost 100% effective. Um, over 100 dB, it should be. So, well, so when he should... says 100 decibels of reduction, he means 99.99, .99, many nines. Right. Yep. Almost 100% right. shielding, yes. Yep. Yeah, these holes are, are uh, they're a pinhole. They're the size of about a, a straight pin. You, you, know? you mean in, in the aluminum foil? Yeah, and they're about every half inch. Every half that, inch. Sheet, that's yeah. for air to get through. I, those are very small, Rob. I, I, I know they're very saying. small. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to see much of a, an issue with that, but yeah, it needs to be tested and right. and seen. Yeah. And I don't have a source here. Thank God, I live on five acres out in the middle of nowhere. So you I'm, don't want to, no. You can't have any sources anywhere near where you live. So no, uh, no. I have my I have a tenant next door with uh, a router, but uh, I don't see much of that in here inside. No, you won't because of reduction uh, with distance and and with the walls in between. So, uh, James, thank you very much. Nice to speak with you and hear from you again. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I um, uh, one last quick question. If any, I know you just guys just put an awesome meter out right now, but. Uh, I had the opportunity to check my my old pro with a friend's pro two just the other day, and uh, it was pretty pretty amazing. 
you you probably don't have any new meters on the market to cover. I mean, they all all kind of need to be separate meters. I could see why. Um, because they're, they're, they're they're designed to measure um, what we get, uh, what we're what we're exposed to in our homes and and near our homes. So mm -hmm. cell frequencies are covered in the range that this covers, which is up to eight gigahertz or so, and, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, cell signals, and so on. Now, it, it, this came up in the chat, and I responded to it, you know, an hour ago. Uh, between six gigahertz or eight gigahertz and twenty gigahertz, it's not empty. There's a lot of stuff out there. A lot, you know, it's it's full. If you look at the 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 representation that the FCC puts out uh, in any given area. Uh, mostly in urban areas, you'll see a lot of different things. But what it represents is police band, aviation, satellites, military, uh, radar. Um, and, and the transmitters are not anywhere near homes, generally. They're on military bases at airports, uh, up in the space, et cetera. So, so by the time it gets over many miles to your house, it's very weak. So that's why we don't worry about it. So thank Got you it. very much, James. Thank uh, you, sir. Appreciate you very much. You're welcome, sir. Nancy, you're next. Hi, I've got questions for Rob. Uh, Go ahead. Rob, uh, a couple questions on the car measurements that you did. Um, uh, what were the maximum levels that you got on the sensors? I couldn't see the meter. Sure, yeah, when I was, yeah, that's the difficulty. It's hard to videotape the, uh, the, the LCD display on that meter, so. Um, when I was near the bumper, it was around 30,000. I think the highest spot was about 100,000, but that was basically um, with the antenna right up against the, uh, the side of the car. So and it does decay quickly as you move away from it. That was um, my other question. How about at 20 foot away, is it going to be gone? It's going to be much less for sure. Um, like when Keith was measuring those cars drive by, I think he was getting readings in, in the tens hundreds. or hundreds. Yeah, yeah, that's what I got in somewhere, Santa Monica as well. Somewhere in that range. So yeah, it's gonna be significantly less. Um, and do you think that uh, pretty much all of these, this radar is, is not gonna be activated unless the car is going six miles per hour or more, or is that just for that one vehicle? Yeah, you're probably not going to see the radar in, in the cities because you, you can't typically turn on your cruise control in a city. It's, you're going to see more of that on, on the highways for sure. But but, but there's there's lane. Um, I think it's uh, some of it's on all the time, Rob, uh, isn't it? Yeah, there's collision detection systems yeah. in there. And I I just don't know. Well, that um, that sheet that I that I. Um, I looked up and, and found out all those transmitters and the frequencies that, that can help us analyze what frequencies are actually out there. But some of them, we don't have meters to measure, unfortunately. And if they're using higher frequency radar um, in the 76 gig range, then we're not yeah. able to measure that, unfortunately. But that's not saying it's still not coming out of the vehicle at certain spots. But, but it is directional and it's, it's aimed outside away from the car. So you're going to be affected by cars that drive by you, not from your own when you're in the true yeah. driver's seat, right? Yeah. No, I, I, I can't drive anymore, and, but I'm concerned about the neighbors driving by me about 20 feet away. On Absolutely. Their and well, I, I'm sitting outside right now and they're passing by. I'm wondering, they've got a new Toyota hybrid and I'm wondering how much radar is coming at me in my, my one eight by eight foot <laughs> square foot area outside that I'm safe in. And I don't have that side shielded. So um, I don't have one of these uh, millimeter wave um, and it prob probably wouldn't pick up their radar anyway. So, um, and unfortunately I found out in the last webinar that they have, uh, that they're shooting radar out the sides of the cars too, not just the front and the back. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we don't have all of the equipment we need to completely assess that. But um, yeah, if there's a building biologist local to you, um, they they will probably have a millimeter wave meter that they could come out and, and do a test for you. But unfortunately, you're only getting a piece of the picture. You're not getting the whole picture. 
Well, I'm hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the nearest building biologist, but I have another question here. What material do you have, like this Swiss Shield fabric, that will shield uh, up to the 400 gigahertz? Well, the 40 gigahertz, um, the Swiss Shield. The 40, I meant. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, the, the Swiss Shield Natural will shield up to um, 40 gigahertz, and we have data on that, and it's still in the um, the 90% shielding effectiveness, like or 96%, I think, 95% somewhere in there for Swiss Shield Naturel, and uh, um, so it, it does offer some some protection. And the bonus with Swiss Shield fabrics is there's no exposed metals on it, like um, a lot of the other shielding fabrics out there. Um, they have exposed metals, where Swiss Shield does not have exposed metals, um, and that's that's key for us and any chemically or electrically sensitive people. Yeah, I've, I've found that myself. In fact, when I was first starting to use some of the uh, fabric years ago, I got some that had it painted on the outside and I actually got an electric shock being too close to something that, some electrical device and it, uh, yeah, I connected with the, the silver painted on it and uh, I thought this isn't the best fabric. <laughs> So okay. I love your, I love the Swiss Shield fabric and I uh, endorse that. Okay, great. No, thanks, Nancy. Yeah, we, Thank we've, you. we've seen that as well. Yeah. Please keep testing these vehicles and uh, the elect, uh, the total EV ones, I would really like to get more information for. And um, some of us who are doing submissions uh, to the federal agencies here, we're trying to um, reply uh, about transportation and vehicles and smart uh, smart roads and all of that. So any information that we can get from you to add to our submissions, we would really appreciate it. Okay, Nancy, yes, we've, we've got a lot of work to do with the millimeter <laughs> wave stuff right now. <laughs> It's just Thank the beginning. You. Yeah, it's I, I know. It's hard to keep up with what the industry is doing. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, thanks for your comments. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, L, you're next. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I was at the last meeting. I have a quick question from Magda. I, I think she was on a little while ago. But, and then one question for um, you all at SLT and Orem. So the question for you, Magda, is um, as far as the five millimeter system or yeah, that's set up around, that could, that may be set up around homes. Others may know this answer too. Um, the 5G ultra band system that may be, if not around the average home, but let's say in the city, um, is that an, you know, I've heard, I've heard a pulsing sound. I heard a pulsing sound for over, I mean, for many, many months prior to anything else I experienced coming from my neighbor's back, you know, big yard area. And anyway, uh, later I, or soon thereafter, I had very high blood pressure, which was unusual. And I know not, nobody can diagnose or say it's exactly that, but is that possible? Is that one possible uh, mechanism for uh, a blood pressure change? Because I know that there's been the writing, science writings on how it can uh, impact the heart, um, the heart beat or the, the pulse, you know, the it, pulsations from the 5G millimeter may impact. All right, no, that's a great question. And yeah, Magda would be the best qualified to answer that one if she's, I'm not sure if she's still on the call. She, she is, she yeah, is, Rob. Right. Um, most of the research uh, has looked at the effects of the radiation on heart rate variability uh, rather than on blood pressure. And basically what it's showing is that some percentage of the population go into a, a, a fight or flight response. So they, go, they develop a stress response, which means their sympathetic nervous system is upregulated and their parasympathetic is downregulated. This is often accompanied by high blood pressure, but that's very individualistic. So the fact that um, you know, you're experiencing high blood pressure, it could be from the uh, radio frequency radiation. 
okay, thank you. And I know there, you know, you have to always rule things out. And I appreciate though that it's um, there's been an association of that. Thank you so much. Okay, and then switching back um, on this whole thing of the five G, and I appreciate the um, the five, you know, the discussion, especially this time where we hear that it, in the cities it may be where. Um, city residents need to um, be concerned about the 5G millimeter in their home inside. Because Absolutely. In, in apartments, buildings, you know, and, and so on. I'll just say, I'll ask this little, this is an easy question. You were beginning to share about the types of mitigation or you know, the, um, that you might do. And you said it has to be solid material, not so much um, like the fabrics. It needs to be something solid. Is that correct? Oil and uh, paint, uh, but Rob. You want yeah, those are those are the most effective, and you'll get you know ninety nine point nine nine percent shielding effective with the effectivity with those um, fabrics. It all depends how they're made. If they're basically a coated fabric, they may do not too bad. Um, but the way the, then they have exposed metals. But the way Swiss Shield works, Swiss Shield is a mesh of wires as well, intercrossed horizontally and vertically. So there are small gaps and that's why we don't see the 99.99. We still see 95% shielding from that though. Okay, I have your materials. Now here, I may be this aberration. And so uh, I'm glad though, Oram, you mentioned how just, it was very, very rare that you found um, um, high level, I mean, the 5G millimeter being an issue for homes. Okay, and well, I re resident when I go into residential neighborhoods where mm, 60 70% of my clients live, I don't right. I don't I don't measure anything. Right. Anyway, why? Because because it costs money for these companies to put these antennas in place. Right. Not, you know, just because they say they need them every third house to get the mm -hmm. coverage everywhere doesn't mean they're going to do that everywhere. They're only going to do it where there's foot traffic. Right. I, I appreciate it. And maybe I'll just follow up. I'd love to follow up because I'll just let you know my quali my my overarching statement is they have form they're formally testing in my area. This is what I mentioned last time, per my whole local government. I know I'm seeing satellites now. I'll just leave it at that over my head and I'm having symptoms. I have the new meter. It registers green with the stub um, antenna. I'm gonna get the next antenna you guys mentioned. Do you you have this one as well, L? Yes, I just got. Both. Oh no, I don't have. I have a safe and sound, but not the. Um, I have the safe and sound, and it reads green. Well, safe and sound pro or the safe and sound millimeter. Oh no, I don't have the safe and sound millimeter. You don't have the blue one. I do have the blue one. I don't have the green one. Okay, you're going to find a lot more activity with this. Ah, uh, okay. A lot more. Because this, oh, this is all the cell signal, the low and mid-band cell signals that we've had for years. Okay, I'll get that. I, I the Wi-Fi. Oh yeah, now, this is this is like a third of the price of this one. Well, I've got the other one. Okay, Thank you. You, you need both. Uh, you know. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, well, just for other you listeners too, what was that solid material you were referring to, though, um, Oram, that might be helpful? I appreciate, and I do have some of the safe and sound products, even the foil. Rob, you. Yeah, that would be at the solid, the, um, the aluminum foil product, RF shielding foil. Okay. Um, that is the best and most economical shielding material that I've that I've seen. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for another awesome session. Thank you Welcome, for attending. Uh, okay, Elizabeth, you're next. Yes, hello. Hi, I have a question just back to the cars again. Um, sure. Now, you know, a lot of the cars have the GPS uh, built-in system. Is that using the same type of radar that you're talking about or? I'm just wondering what is a good way to, for example, if you're traveling, you need some form of a GPS. Is it better to try to use your cell or is it better to use the built-in car GPS system? Yeah, I would I would say like the, the built-in car GPS system, it's a receiver. It has an antenna on the roof that receives the satellite signals with uh, the GPS coordinates and screens. Um, it's at uh, 1.5 gigahertz, I believe, and it's only a receiver. 
Um, now, if you use your phone, that's using the cell phone tower. So it's, it's sending data over the, over the air to the cell, back and forth to the cell phone tower. So you get more exposure with the using your cell phone um, for a GPS as opposed to the built-in system in your vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any guideline for if you're trying to uh, purchase a car? I mean, I imagine older models are better. They don't have as much many gadgets, but do you guys have any guidelines about that, about purchasing a vehicle? Um, or I'm going to let you go too, but I, I would just get the various meters available to test for electric, magnetic, and radio frequency it's, waves. And unfortunately, they change so much. Yeah. And they're different almost every year. It's just so hard to know what to expect in a vehicle without actually doing the particular measurement on that particular vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have an, an article on my website, uh, createhealthyhomes.com, uh, then click on education, which takes you to a separate section where all the articles are that I've written over the years. And then you, you'll find cars. I think it's all the way over on the right under uh, all about EMFs. And then I think that's where the car EMFs and cars article is. But the thing is, uh, the, the, the um, Rob Metzinger, Larry Gust, uh, Mitch Marshawn, uh, myself, uh, we teach our students in the building biology profession to, uh, and Spark Burmester has been uh, one of our teachers for, for decades. We, we teach students and our practitioners how to uh, evaluate homes, buildings. And, and, you know, so 120 volts here, 240 volts uh, in Europe, uh, and it, it, magnetic fields, electric fields, radio frequencies, and dirty electricity with the various meters that we use. And so we're pretty good at that, but cars, have a completely different a, a nervous system, a completely different wiring. Uh, they're not 120 volts. There's DC, there's AC, 24 volts DC. There's there's 80 volts AC, but the vol the voltages vary. Spark has taught me a lot about this over the decades. Um, you can have uh, a, a, you have a, you have AC wiring, which causes magnetic fields that we measure with our AC Gauss meters, um, and and so you'll have uh, that current going to the different uh, loads, but the return is not a single wire that's that's in the same path as the hot wire, like an uh, like a circuit in your wall, like you have here with this romet with a hot here and the neutral here and the, and the ground. Um, they'll use the grounding system of the car, which is just all the metal of the chassis as the return path back to the battery, or back to the alternator, I should say. You know, and and uh, so there's no cancellation of the magnetic fields. And then the mag the alternator is a huge point source of magnetic fields that comes right through uh, the, the the firewall because magnetic fields go through virtually everything. You can put you can slide the 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 G iron Armoflex or that you carry, Rob. You know, which comes 25 inches wide, and then it's sold by the foot, like fifty dollars a foot. You can slide that under the the pedals and and. Uh, but I, I have no AC magnetic fields when I drive my Prius plug-in hybrid on battery, none. Wow. And then when the engine kicks on, that's when the magnetic field comes. And it's about a, a one and a half milligauss. Now it's full of RF. You know, I've got I've got all the radar that that Rob talks about. You know, which I appreciate, uh, but I'm not electrically sensitive, and I, I want that those safety features. You know, and uh, so. For electrically sensitive clients uh, uh, that I have, they have older model cars that don't have the 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 um, the, the radar. They don't have uh, the the. Sometimes you can turn off the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes it says it's off, but the meter shows that it still is. I turn the car off and then it goes away. And then I called up. Uh, you know, I had a, a Volkswagen Passat, and and the dealer said, "Well, we don't even. It's not. That's not us." That comes with the communication module that you selected and we slid in there. It's made in Kentucky and has nothing to do with Volkswagen. It's 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 the communication that has all the CD and the, the radio and such. That comes with that. And so uh, it, it's a daunting task. It, it is. Uh, and um, also, I know in the global EMF project, Magda has worked on automobiles as well and has a protocol for measuring them. But I believe it's only for the RF section. I don't think we're doing magnetic and electric for the vehicles at this point. So it's pretty tough to, to find a database with all that information in it. Um, yeah. So anyway, 
Would you say in general for EMF sensitives that electric cars are just no good? No, not necessarily. Oh. I'm telling you, if, if, if you're looking at magnetic field, AC magnetic fields, yeah. uh, they're, they're much, the, the AC magnetic fields in the driver's compartment are much higher generally from uh, gasoline powered cars that we've all driven for decades from the mm -hmm. alternator and from this lack of cancellation of current running on the, um, the wiring on, right on the other side of the firewall than in battery cars, battery, uh, hundred, uh, fully full battery cars, full electric cars, uh, run on 24 volts DC. There's no alternator. There's no gasoline engine. It's just 24 volts DC. You won't pick up anything with your AC gauss meter. How many of you have a DC gauss meter? Cause that's what you're measuring. You see 24 volts, DC electric, you know, electricity produces DC magnetic fields. We don't pick that up with an AC gauss meter. Mm. And, and the assumption that batteries must have all these EMF, I, I don't understand it. It's counterintuitive. At least the AC gauss meters that we use, I don't pick up uh, anything. When I'm on pure battery for the first 35 miles after a charge overnight in my Prius plug-in prime hybrid, zero. Zero magnetic fields on my NFA 1000. Interesting. So, Interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. You, you know, can I just pipe in real quick ahead of this other person? In response to what Elizabeth was talking about, um, I, I don't know this for sure, but I heard that the Teslas are the one of the only ones because I very had low. My They're very low, James. And 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 uh, the Tesla dealer in in Santa Monica said we know about EMS, and we 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 actually, and he was right. I've I've ridden in four Teslas for my clients as we're driving, and and I didn't pick up any. Now this is all I measured was AC magnetic fields. They're right. full of RF. Right. They're yeah. full of RF. So, uh, but but the thing that most most electrically sensitive people react to is the is the varying voltages. So it's the dirty electricity. Uh, Spark, help me understand this. That's what yeah. most EHS people react to. Like in a pre like a Prius with the regenerative braking drives right. them crazy. They cannot be in, in in a hybrid car for that for that reason. I didn't know Mag that long time i didn't realize I, i'm i'm pretty sensitive myself and it took me a while to figure it all out with the prius because we got the first priuses that came out you know 20 plus years ago so anyway right, right. yeah thanks james magda you had a comment yeah i was just going to say we've measured hybrid cars and they do have a high magnetic field right near the battery which is often in the back seat which is where you would put an infant um, so are you measuring with an ac gauss meter yep Oh, so so the engineers among us help help us understand where does that come from with with DC twenty four volt DC current? Where's the AC magnetic field? Well, it's a hybrid car, so it has alternating current too. Oh, that's right. It has a gas engine as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's true. It's a it's a hybrid. It's not a not a yeah. pure electric. Okay, got it. Thank you for that comment. Uh, T, uh, TH, uh, and Joan, we're getting to you. I know you You said in the chat, uh, I'm just going through. Okay, TH is up next. It's just wh whoever put hey their, their... Hi, guys. Um, I've uh, purchased a good number of meters and shielding from Safe Living over the years. And my question is to Rob regarding the uh, attenuation rating for all the shielding material. Uh, was that done in-house by your company? And if so, can I ask what the... Uh, the uh, power, uh, the source power density levels uh, were that you used to create the ratings? Um, the ones we have on our website are from the manufacturers at this point. Um, I think some of our materials are only evaluated up to 18 gigahertz. Um, I'd have to go through them all and see which ones we did and which ones. No, I, I didn't uh, mean the uh, frequency range. I meant the uh, power densities specifically in the mid mid band range uh, uh, for the material. Like I'm saying, what was, uh, you know, did you just use a cell phone behind the Oh no, no, they would they're they're done and most of them are done in, in testing labs and they use signal generators. Um do you, do you know and, and how high fire. the power density is that they, they actually test at? I might have to go through and read through the studies, but it would be probably um in the range of a thousand probably a, a, above a thousand microwatts per square meter. I'm not sure exactly what levels they were they were tested okay. at. Do you know either from experience or 
from the manufacturers whether the shielding effectiveness changes uh, or the DB rating curve changes uh, depending on the power density levels? For shielding material, usually no, but for measuring devices, there's, there's a potential for that to change. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm just, uh, I'm in an unfortunate position where uh, I'm in the process of shielding uh, my girlfriend's apartment in New York City, and they installed a salt tower 20 feet from her front door facing her apartment. Mm -hmm. And luckily, they haven't turned it on yet. Uh, they've tested it, but they're not turning on to October. Um, and this is with a uh, dish network. They're apparently turning on thousands of new installations in October. Mm -hmm. And um, dish is using pure 5G technology from the ground up, by the way. They have no 4G customers like the other three companies do. So they're all using oh, yes. standalone. Well, it, yeah, uh, well, it's uh, the company is JMA Wireless. They're, they're, their website says they're the leading 5G technology in New York City. I've taken pictures of the actual installation on her rooftop. It has the uh, the actual frequency range. It's uh, it's low band and mid band. Yeah, mid band that makes only. sense. Yeah. Um, wait, wait. Low uh, mid is what again? Say it again. Uh, well, I have to look at the picture, but it's approximately uh, mid six hundred to eight hundred uh, megahertz, and then oh, and right. it also has one point eight gigahertz to two point four ish gigahertz, two point three. That's all. That's that's low band, and then the lower part of the mid band. Uh, you yeah, can't, yes. They don't beam form below two two gigahertz, from what I was told at the. At the 5G conference, oh, yeah, 20, well, 20, I, 20 I, feet, you're going to get a significant level oh, coming off in there. Blast it. Well, well yeah. I, I uh, so then the way the way I, you I, would I, look, I, the way you got to look at that is if if there's a thousand microwatts per square meter hitting you or a hundred thousand, you know, the shielding is going to perform the same. It's going to be, you know, it's going to offer you a dB level in shielding, and that's going to be 99.9 .9 something percent without reflections. Uh, right that, that's in theory in a in a lab it's only, um, yeah with one yeah, I, source well, I, in I, one i'm not direction. concerned about uh shooting for for just uh even a half million mark watts uh her, i measured on her rooftop and this is another point uh the tires aren't on yet but across the street about 80 feet away on the rooftop of the next building they have uh they have mid-band towers that were installed during covid mm -hmm. and and on my Safety and Sound Pro, Pro uh, and I own two of them, uh, and my girlfriend just bought another, I measured on it 3.18 million microwatts, which I know is above where, what it's Where? Where? In her, across the way, in her apartment? or No, 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 on the, on the rooftop, in open air, open view site of the cell tower across the street, which is about 80 feet away. Um, so I guess that, you know, it might... And my concern is also that the the phased array beamforming technology is not exclusive to, to 5G, and it, it maybe it could be called 5G, but I, I I am certain has been it has been in installed in old 4G uh, technologies as well. There's a lot to unpack in what you just said. I, 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 that's what that's what I'm learning. That's why I'm going to these meetings to to learn all of that. Right, well, those I mean, or, yes. I mean, these are industry meetings that you you you're going to correct. And, yep. and you did mention last time before that they told you before that that the million the MM waves would never pass through anything. And obviously, you learned that that's no. not true. Pass through glass and fabric. They didn't. Quite, no, their expectation, and it doesn't pass through walls. Even even just well, yeah, regular. Yeah. I know that. Uh, oh, we lost you. Are you still there? Oops. Oh, uh, TH, you still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, you you dropped out in the last twenty seconds. You're coming and going. Okay, uh, Terry, let's go to you next. Okay, hi everyone. Great to see you. Thank you for being such great teachers. So, um, got a little conundrum for us city dwellers. Um, and TH, I just want to say it's possible to shield apartments very nicely. Oh, Terry, it, Terry, you're in Manhattan. I didn't right, recognize what, you. Yes. Yeah, right. It's, right. It's, it's, it, it's been um, it's been uh, 11 years since our uh, since the training with everyone in Evanston. So great to see everyone. Um, 
But TH, I want to say it's possible in New York City to shield your living space. You have to be extremely diligent. I've had a lot of help from Orem and Rob and, and the whole team. You can live safely in New York, but it's, you know, in your apartment, but it's, it's a great deal of work. It is possible. So the conundrum I'm having is with everything going on with driving, you know, and how we live in the city, I was following Dr. Klinghart's advice to wear the shielding clothing, which I've been wearing when I drive and when I go out and about, but I'm hearing Rob say that that's not a great idea because the shielding, a lot of the shielding clothing, which comes from a different company, it sounds like what's being said is that on some level, the shielding clothing is transmitting frequency by touching our skin. No, so, it doesn't transmit a frequency, but it allows it to pass through. There is some attenuation. It's just not, but it's not as much attenuation as, as it was in the old days with the, the lower frequencies with the longer wavelengths or, or, um, it, so remember, it depends on frequency slash wavelength and power density and their and, and distance. Right. right. So those of us that know a lot, we have a lot of information with which to be scared and freaked out and immobilized. Or, or to not be scared and freaked out. Right. So I'm very grateful that Lloyd is doing this documentary because he'll cover things like earthing and PEMF and taking salt baths and you know, EMS, by the way, have very high electric fields if they're not grounded. That's a real problem with those things. Anyway. Sorry. Right. So coming back to my question is, how can those of us that live in cities, I've been wearing shielding clothing whenever I walk around, whenever I drive. And now I'm hearing that I, that it's really not a good thing to be wearing. So um those well, Terry, I think it's it's more individual too. Like different people react differently to it, and some people are compatible with one and not the other. So it's okay. kind of you almost got to treat it as a little experiment and um, see what try, works for you. Try them and see yeah, what works I'm, for you. Basically, I'm, yes. I'm not I'm not electrosensitive. I just know too much. Um, well, you're very concerned about it. I mean, you know, you've been well, dialoguing with me for a decade, and and because of your concern, and that's that's good. Good for you. You're paying attention to this for your health. Well, pl please let me in interrupt. Uh, but now there you are. Go ahead. Yeah. But I, I, I've built many more, more Faraday spaces and rooms than I ever wanted to in my life. Uh, maybe eight or nine so far. And uh, it was I learned from Jack Cruz. I, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's he's basically has been telling everyone that the the MM wave spectrum will jump conduct onto any metal, including uh, 5G clothing that has the silver on the inside and cotton on the outside. And from my own personal experience, even before I got the uh, the MM wave meter from you guys when it came out a little over a month ago, I was wearing the the, the Get Lambs clothing for a week in New York City, and my Bristol chart was totally destroyed that entire week while I was doing everything correctly. And and when I stopped wearing the clothing, just by coincidence, after the fact, I realized that my Bristol went back to normal. Um, so uh, I I. You guys have heard of the, they have wireless device wireless cell phones now that are charged uh, with wi wirelessly by uh, I believe it's jump conduction where the electricity is passing through the air. Well, that's that's exactly what's happening. It's using millimeter waves, correct? Mm, not sure, but th it has to do with proximity. Don't forget that. Right, right, but but any jump conduction of millimeter waves onto this onto the body, I yes, if the source I, is close enough to you. Right. Well, I mean, I, even if it's a hundred microwatts, which to me, with 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 millimeter waves, is is you know unacceptable. You know, correct. I, I, I think any exposure to MM waves is unacceptable. But 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 th. If you live in Manhattan, you're in the hot seat. Oh, I know. I, I split my time with California here right now. I'm in a small town, Northern California. I, I exactly. And you I, don't have millimeter wave. Oh, I, 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 Yes, I, I know that. I mean, I do at, at the grocery store. I, I posted a picture earlier. Well, that's that's the, different. Yes, right, that's right, 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 right. But not cell, not cell signals. But, and why? Because Verizon. Why would they do that? There's no, there's no outdoor foot traffic. That's right, where right. they put these well, things. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not. I mean, yeah. They'll, they'll not, do. They'll yeah. do low band and mid band. By the exactly. way, I just read this morning that uh, that the satellite companies that were trying to give back um, their spectrum to, to finish the, the the deployment of the of the mid-band signals uh, uh, that uh, or frequencies 
in markets that uh, Verizon and to a lesser extent AT&T bought two years ago, uh, were able to, to transition out of those frequencies early rather than December of this year. They're doing it now, so they're completed. So, so the FCC has said to Verizon, you can turn on all of your C-band, all the rest of your C-band uh, that you were waiting to do in December, you can do it now in August. So the full array of, of C-band is going to be uh, operational in, in a matter of weeks for the Verizon and AT&T companies. So the mid-band is the sweet spot for these cell companies because the frequencies are, are uh, the, the wavelength is, is of a- Right, of they a, pass through everything, yes. That they can pass through everything, that they can go for a few miles. Um, it's not like the low band, but, and, and, but the, the download speeds are like 10 times, you know, 280, 250 megabits per second instead of uh, uh, 12 to 48 for, for that 4G that we're all used to. So what, what, do you guys know how I could have measured 3.18 million mark watts on the Safe and Sound Pro 2? And I've not only have I measured that, I, I hate to admit, but from I, a cell phone, what, I've measured 7 million mark watts on the Safe and Sound Pro 2, which I know isn't supposed to go over 2.5 million. You'd have to be oh, really close there's, to there's, a transmitter to get 3 million. I was eighty feet. I was eighty feet away from the cell tower. Rob, yeah, in direct line of sight, and there's probably multiple transmitters as well. I would imagine. Um, right. Well, but I, I also measured seven million mark watts. Uh, that doesn't make uh, sense because no, yeah, no, no, two first, inches, two inches first, from two inches from my cell phone. But and I have, the, I have the meter, th the meter. Yeah, the meter maxes out. The early ones maxed out at two point five million, and the uh, the future ones. Um, after the first four or five batches, we got it up to 3.1 million, somewhere in that range. So you won't um, see a number higher than that. Teenage. No, exactly. Yeah, I wouldn't. See, I wouldn't expect to see a seven million. Um, I, I was shocked to, to see it myself as well. Um, and I, you know, I own two, and my girlfriend just bought another. Um, but okay. I mean, ho hopefully, it's just an error. Uh, but I am concerned about being form phase array being forming with with the mid band 4G, 5G. Uh, you know, that's an issue for people that are in the cities. Uh, okay. So TH, let, let's get back to Terry. Uh, she, she's right, she's yeah, she got cut off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, TH. Uh, Thanks for your help. Thank you. Go ahead, Terry. Uh, you're muted. Last question, very generally. Um, I understand I'm getting that car shielding is very, you know, finicky and different for every car model. Um, my question would be is if we decide to put some of the film over the car windows, if we have old cars, um, can the film be by the radiators in the windows or that we can't use the film for that reason? And, and would it sort of generally add some protection if we don't use the radiator, you know, to, you know, on the rear windows? Um, I, I, if there's a simple answer, and that's my last question. Thank you. Um, so you're meaning the the defoggers, like those um, the wires that are embedded in the glass. Yes. yes. Can okay. the does that affect the uh, window film? It won't damage the window film. No, it it can take the heat. It should be that should be fine. And uh, then your other question was in regards to will the electric fields couple onto it and transfer off? Is that what you're? You, no, you're I didn't. No. I I'm just trying to very generally understand if I should consider shielding my car windows with the with the um signal protect clear yeah you just want to make sure you have no transmitters on on the inside and um that's part of the challenge because you're not able to turn off some of those transmitters in some vehicles okay as well, so right? so that circles back to my original question we're out in the world with a lot of things that are scary that are beyond our control so I understand we take care of ourselves. We live without these devices. Um, but it, again, your feeling generally is that it's the choice to wear protective clothing or shield yourself as individual. Mm -hmm. and, but when you go to the center of Toronto or Orm goes to downtown LA, um, you just don't worry about it. Because exactly, yeah, that, exactly. Like I, I'm, I'm, I can. I don't think I'm electrically sensitive. I think I'm electrically aware. I, there's films right. that I get. Good way of putting it, Rob. When yeah. I'm exposed that uh, I know I'm, I've been in a high exposure environment. And, you know, I, I realize that during the day traveling around, I'm not going to be able to block everything. But when I get home, um, rest assured, everything is completely under control here. And 
Um, fortunately, my body is able to recover when I'm in my, I guess, RF sanctuary at home in the country, and my body can repair from the day's damage um, that, I've, that I've absorbed or taken on in, in, in the big cities. And uh, I think that's, a, for most of us, I think that's about as good as we can get. Um, or you experiment with some shielding clothing and see if it works for you. Okay, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you Welcome, very Terry. much, Terry. Uh, Rory, you're next. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Rory, and ask your question. Me? Are you there? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. So my question is um, regarding uh, a lot of times in commercial buildings, they put the equipment rooms where the transmitter is, all the data cable comes into the transmitters, which goes up to the antennas. And right. So I'm just wondering if anybody's had any experience in, it's kind of ironic too, because this is in a medical building, a cancer treatment building. And um, I got to determine, is there a lot of magnetic fields, RF fields? Is there a lot of bleeding coming out of those rooms from the transmitters? The transmitters are not where the radios are. And sometimes they're built in together, but but uh, they, they could be like 10, 15 feet from each other, but um, it just... Yeah, yeah the room... The room is separate. It's a Verizon, you know, and it says keep back danger RF. And that's where they have, I guess they bring all their data cables in, connect that. And then that goes up to the antenna on the roof, right? Yeah, those, those cables are using to carry the signal from the, uh, the base of the tower all the way up. Um, depending on the frequency, they could be cables or they could be something called waveguides, um, which is basically a, a hollow pipe that high frequency RF signals need to trans transmit on or transmit through because they don't carry well on wires. So mm -hmm. they put them in these, these wave guys, these, these tubes that carry um, the gigahertz signals up to the, the tower and then transmit out of that. But each of those cables should be shielded very well. And I don't see a lot of emissions coming off the cables themselves, but transmitting RF requires a lot of power too. So there's going to be some huge transformer usually at the base of a tower or somewhere on a roof nearby a tower that you're going to get a large magnetic and a large magnetic field from probably um, I don't it could be electric too but primarily a, a magnetic field because of all the power that those towers and transmitters are using so that's where that would come into play maybe the power feed lines you would read high magnetic fields off of but I wouldn't expect it to be on the data cables. Okay, so that room, if they were to build, they want to build another room right next to that Verizon room where the transformers are. I know it drops off, magnetic fields will drop off. I, I wouldn't want to live beside that. <laughs> no, no, you, you said the magic word, you said a trans, the transmitters. Right. So, so you're up on the roof now? No, so the antenna on the roof, but then you, it goes down to this room that they have. But wait, 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 wait. The antennas are the transmitters. They're one and the same. Right. So what's in that room? That's where the radio, the radio, the radio, the yeah. data cables come in from that they connect to for phone. Well, right? the, like the backhaul system, back fiber optic cables that right. come in and, you know, transfer data be, from one point of the country to another point and rebroadcast it out, out into the air local yeah. to that particular cell phone it's trying to talk to, right? See, there's a whole backhaul network that people are not aware of. I, I, a client thought that when she's in Los Angeles and talking to her sister in Seattle, that when she she she's on Verizon, she thought that the call went from her phone to Veri the Verizon tower that was closest to where she was. And then right. it went from Verizon tower to Verizon tower to Verizon tower, up the California coast, all the way up to Seattle, and then off to her sister. I said, no, 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 no. It would be completely distorted and wouldn't work. Yeah. Yeah, right. There's a backhaul network that uses fiber optic. It uses uh, uh, mostly satellite, uh, and then microwave towers that that are point to point and like ten miles apart, uh, you know, uh, around the curve of the Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's how the that's how it goes from city to city. Sure, and that's what's in that room. So, that's so uh, Rory, Rory Ward up in uh, San Francisco, and <laughs> I recognize. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, say that last comment again. Well, that's what's in that room. All that what you just explained, all the fiber and well, well, and, well, well see, no, that's, a friend, that's that's the friendly way to send data. Um, the unfriendly way is when it hits those transmitters and scatters through the air, right? Right. 
That's where the RF is. And you don't yeah. want to be behind them. You don't want to be under them or near them at all. It's, it's you know, people, Pat, these workers pass out if they get right in front of them. Uh, uh, Chuck Keen tells stories about that. Yeah. Was well, that room dangerous? Because it says keep back and it does say danger. Well, we don't, it's just hard to know what else is in there, Rory. Yeah. And is it, is it danger? Be, it says is RF danger. Um, yeah. Yeah. Rory, you, you sent an email and I'm sorry, I haven't gotten back to you. You sent it 10 days ago. And so, yeah. so, so where is this? So there's a room in the building, but then yeah. the transmitter is up on the roof. Is that okay. right? Yeah. So I haven't been there because I, you know, they're waiting to approve this, but they want to build a uh, uh, cancer treatment. There's a machine that they want to put in a room right next to this Verizon room. Where the, where, the, where the radios are. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, now before you go any further about what, and Rob just talked about, you know, the magnetic fields that would come. Yeah. There, there's no radio signals coming from the radio. Okay. There's cables then, and Peter, sir, can, can uh, 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 talk to this too. Uh, there's cables up to the transmitters, which are above, they're, they're, they're on the outside of, of a room. Right. There, there would be a, there could be a parapet, you know, uh, but, but, and there's always a, a plastic rain cover, but the transmitters will be at the edge of the, of the roof or, or, you know, because it needs to get out to the horizon. Hmm. So, so it's not it like ham out. radio, you know, ham radio, you have the transmitter and the radio in front of you, and then it goes up, sends it up to the antenna on the roof. Yeah. But the transmission doesn't happen from the radio. It happens from the transmitter on the roof. Okay. That's yeah, where the RF just, is. Okay. So they're but, just powering but, and bringing the back end in, like but, you're saying. The data but, cables. So, say it again. So just the fiber optics and the data cables are all coming into that room, and that's what's powering the uh, antennas, but it's not the signal. The transmitters are on the roof with the antennas. Well, it's powering it, but it's also providing the data, the, the information yeah. that's being transmitted. But but the, but the I'm telling you, you know, uh, Robin and, I and and Peter and others are telling you that the RF signal that goes out at at the at the at the you know at the signal to the to the customers out there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on the street and for a mile or or a mile and a half, two miles, um, you don't want to be behind that or below it. I mean, we've all gone in. Uh, uh, you know, Rob and Peter and I have gone into buildings where we've had clients and offices and and apartments. In the, in the floor right below the transmitters and behind okay. them uh, or or worse yet in front of them where, where this where like like you can have a building with a top floor here and then there's another where the elevator is and that's where the antennas were set back and then the signal goes out and, and down and mm -hmm. and it, it goes into occupied space on that uh, top floor and that you don't want to be anywhere near that rory including okay, behind it yeah. because you could get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of microwatts on a, on a steady basis, 4G. Like yeah. It's always on. Um, and, you know, you don't want to sleep there. You don't want to sit there. So it's, it's, an, it's a no-go from, uh, you're nowhere near 100, 10 to 100 microwatts for healthy people. And an EHS person, they can't tolerate 10 microwatts. Okay. Yeah. You'll, you'll be nowhere near that. And, and, and so for a cancer, you, know, you, need, you need to inform them that RF is carcinogenic. I know it's ironic. Okay, well, I'll locate those and be aware of that. But then I just like do a magnetic test around the room just to make sure there's nothing. Yeah, but I, I, my first inclination would be, what is what does your RF? So you know, if you got out a, a standard, uh, you know, we're not dealing with with uh, millimeter waves now. Generally, yeah. we're talking about the four G there, and it could be right. you know, it could. When I say four G. I mean low band, mid band, and I mean whatever 5G might be added to that. But to me, that's just souped up 4G. It's, it, it is more uh, biologically active. It's mm -hmm. a little faster. It's much more modulated. But they even, you know, that, remember I showed you that graph where, where three quarters or 80% of the data traffic is still to this day 4G. But it's all, it's now advanced 4G. It's more modulated and it's, it's causing more biological effects. Electrically sensitive people are saying I could walk in my neighborhood, even though there was a 4G tower there for for ten years. But now the Verizon truck came along and they made a change. It's not millimeter wave; it's C band or something. And and now I can't be there, right. or or they they upgraded the 4G. There's no 5G; it's just 4G. But they upgraded it, mm -hmm. and and now I can't walk there. I'm feeling a, a, a worse. 
So there right. is biological, uh, there is a biological effect. Anyway, uh, where we got to move on. So thank uh, you. All right. Thank you, sir. Nice thank to you. hear from you. you okay, you're up next. You want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Are you there, Kay? Uh, am I next? Uh, well, there's someone who's who's just Kay. Uh, all okay. right, well, let's let's go to Lori. Lori, you're next. Hi, I, I think I just got my answer. I asked if uh, you had the RF shield on the windows, the signal protect, and you needed to use your cell phone, would you be getting more exposed? And Tyler said potentially yes, which makes sense. So if I'm, I know I want to protect from the outside radar, but I also occasionally need to use my cell phone or someone else in my car might be using it inside. So I don't know if getting the film would make sense. Uh, Rob, you want to sp speak to that? And you're muted. Sorry, I'm muted here and I'm just away from my desk for a second. Um, I missed the first part of that question. Oh, if I have the um, the uh, signal protect clear film to protect from outside radar, and I occasionally might need to use my cell phone for GPS to download the directions, which I then put on airplane mode actually, um, or someone else in my car is using a cell phone, we're gonna get exposed more because we have the uh, film on the windows, right? Um, yeah, it will increase. It'll, there'll, there'll be more reflections. Um, the chassis is all metal in most vehicles, so it's there's reflection off the chassis too. So, yeah, using a, um, a, a wireless transmitter inside a shielded area is not not the greatest idea. But um, it's all tr you know what it's it's hard to know what's right, um, and it all comes down to trade offs. It depends on the area you're traveling through. If it, if you're getting blasted with RF continually maybe it's worth it and you, you are going to get elevated exposure if you use it from time to time inside the car but you know what's the net result you know in an hour's time are you better off or are you worse off you know and, that, and that's like data logging over long periods of time and figuring out what's what's better or what's worse um, they're both negatives but which is the worst negative i guess that's that's the kind of the way you gotta look at it so Hard to say um, exactly, because each each area and each circumstance is different. Yeah, um, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, folks, it's uh, three hours and forty minutes. Um, we've let's just take two more questions from Nancy and Rita, and then also Simona, who uh, I don't know how to turn how to raise uh, anyway. And then and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Uh, Tony, is that and Rob, is that agreeable to you guys? Sounds good. Okay, uh, so Rita, Betty, uh, Rita, Nancy. Uh, well, Betty, <laughs> you snuck in there. Uh, we can't oh. take any more questions. Um, oh, it's Rita. I'm, I'm pretty quick. I'm pretty okay, okay, quick okay. Just very quick. Uh, no, we, we, we'll, uh, but no, no more questions after Nancy, Rita, Betty, and Simona. Nancy, you're and yeah, okay. you've been up before, but Thank you. make it quick, Thank please. You. Yeah. Uh, well, my friend uh, and my EMS friend Deborah just arrived here. And she sent uh, Rob a message, uh, a question earlier. <laughs> um, she's been, uh, she gets 0.1 gigabit of internet upload and download with CenturyLink. <laughs> it, and they call, they charge her for high speed. We are trying to, she has to use a cell phone in order to get on the internet and to do any Zooms or anything else. And we're trying to find a way for her to get some uh, safe internet. And her question to Rob today is, uh, is and to anyone else um, uh, that's hosting is, uh, is there a satellite uh, option or is there a dish option that she could put far away on her property and run a cable to her house? Um, Starlink is the only one that comes to mind at this point. Um, well, also, also the in-town uh, uh, wireless LTE, internet. LTE in-town. Well, well, there are companies out in rural areas, Rob. That you know, you know that that advertise um, a, a connection, and you 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 put it 
an antenna on on a pole at the perimeter of your property or even on the side of your house right. and then that sends signals to the town and receives very weak signals that that are there anyway uh that come from a transmitter on a mountain or or in town uh and and then it it it, it there's a a cable a coaxial cable from that antenna that then brings it into a, their modem and their router and um uh, and then disseminates it through typical Wi-Fi, but you can turn that off and you can plug in Ethernet cables and be hardwired that way. So there are people who I've worked with, electrically sensitive people, who have this arrangement and the, anten the, the, the antenna that, that transmits the signal back is on the edge of their property on a pole. And yeah, then there's right. an it's a directional antenna that... Yep. Um, yep. It's a parabolic antenna. And, 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 transmit and, behind it. Yes. and a cable how, that... About that, how far from her house would she need to have that? You know, that's where it gets into an individual thing, depending on how oh, sensitive God. a person is, Nancy. Um, There's no cut and dry. If I said 100 feet, you know, someone's going to say, well, that's not enough for me. Feet? As no, far as possible. No, no, yeah. 100 feet. So, no, 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 no. no I'm, I'm making that up. I'm just yeah, saying yeah. we yeah. can't give a number. And and plus, th there's a certain distance that the company they'll say, all right, we'll go out, you know, we'll go out so many feet and then we'll put our pole out there. You got to talk to the, what's technically feasible because they have to, they have to dig a little trench and put the. And you no. want it, you want it elevated to like elevation will help as well as distance. Yeah. She's got a barn that they might be able to put it on. Put it on the barn, but, yeah. but it has to face in the direction of their, of their transmitter. Right. right. And you it's just transmitter and you receive. Just, you just don't want to be between the transmitter and the tower. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And, okay. and th then it's just a matter of, of what they can tolerate. So is that is that good, Nancy? Is that good, Deborah? I, I it's confusing to me, but I'll but I'll I'll she may contact you again, Robin. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. She needs more, but sure, uh, yeah, it's it's a four G LTE internet connection basically. And it's okay. an antenna that points to a tower and there's a cable that comes inside and brings your internet inside. And if it's at a distance you should be okay with it. Well, anything is better than her having to use her cell phone. Which of course. Is really right. Right. Of and, course. And yeah. and she's already gotten a sort of a uh, a resurgence of the EMS, and we really need to get her connected to uh, inter internet that will actually work safely. Where, so, where 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 does she live? We're in Southwest Colorado. There's Southwest Colorado does has very little high speed. Okay, okay. I, I say that because there are building biologists uh, in in Boulder, several of them. I know yeah, that that's had, uh, we've had uh, Ryan at Ryan here, okay. um, but um, yeah, it's it's a trek for him. I know, I know. It's it's many many hours. <laughs> I know. Thank you, ladies. We, we we appreciate this. Thank you. You're, You're welcome. welcome, Rita. Yes, thank you. I the other day was in the backyard. We have underground cables and metal boxes in our yard. I was raking. I started coughing and uh, throwing up and it lasted. You know, I had to run away from the area. So is this what's happened with the upgrade in uh, or including 4G? We don't I, I've know. Never had that happen. Yeah. OK. I, people call. I'm sure they call Rob, they call me all the time, and they 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 immediately jump to the conclusion it's gotta be 5G. We yeah. don't know that for sure. It could be magnetic oh. fields, could be electric fields, could, uh -huh. could be an RF source right near them, could be dirty electricity. Where where do you live, Rita? I live in Colorado, Littleton, Colorado. Littleton. In a yes. You're closer and I've to had Ryan. Yeah. Let's right. see. Excuse me. I have had him to a downtown Denver home and he did an excellent job helping us there. And uh, our, our son had to sell that property. But how far because... are you from, from Boulder in Littleton? You're oh close. yeah, no, I could, I could call Ryan. Yeah. He's a half an I hour just, away. Well, yeah, I just, I just uh, saw that this was available and it was so shocking that just happened that I, um, I've never had that happen since I've lived here. So something's changed in the backyard. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> When anyone calls me with oh. with with a, with, with a, a set of symptoms like that, the question to us to, uh, th that I I need to know data. What are the what what I what see. what does a meter read on your right. property? 
well, that's I, that, yeah. that's how I can help yeah. a person. Very and I good. will only come to a conclusion once I have okay. data. Uh, and I respect that. Thank you. I apologize. I, I don't have the data. I did have a, no, I, I'll get in touch with Ryan. <laughs> you, need, you need to <laughs> have a, someone uh, you come yeah. and, and do that. For I you. agree. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Betty. Let's see, did I get unmuted? Yes. We, we can hear, hear you, Betty. Now. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I am fairly uh, electromagnetically hypersensitive. I have people come visit me in my home or get into my car with a cell phone. I have a metal box in my house that I've had somebody test by putting a, a cell phone in it and using a meter to see that the metal box does actually block the field. Um, but I'm very uncomfortable with some people that don't know how to turn their cell phone off. And one of my questions would be, how do I tell somebody to turn their phone off if I'm worried about all fields that it could um, radiate? Do I tell them to put it on uh, airplane mode or did I tell them to turn it all the way off? That's my first question. Second question is, is there something else that's lighter than this metal box that I've got? Is there a cloth or some kind of a pouch or something that I can carry with me in my car. Somebody jumps in my car, they don't know how to turn anything off and it's quicker to just throw this phone in a bag or cover it with a cloth to get me away from all fields is my second question. All right, um, I'll take part of it. Um, the bags to put them in. Um, a metal box is the best because it's solid metal. So if you're going to do something like that, you could almost just even take a piece of aluminum foil from your kitchen and you know wrap a phone in that, and that'll that'll do a very effective job in blocking radiation um, that we're concerned about. Or there's there's other boxes and metal devices out there that you can purchase. I think from from other companies out there as well. Um, there's they're they're available, and you want ones with the highest shielding power. Um, so that usually means solid metal, like there's some made out of mesh, which I'd, I'd recommend more of a solid metal, like, um, you know, a steel box or um, an aluminum box or wrapping the phone with solid aluminum foil, you know, so that would, that, that's what you could do um, with the phones. Um, I'm going to let Orem take the, uh, the first part of that question with, or add on to this. Um, with the airplane mode on a phone? So uh, I'll start with iPhones. Um, when you put it in airplane mode, it's still possible for the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to be on or in what's called not connected mode. Uh, and there are two ways to turn Wi-Fi and Bluetooth off and go into airplane mode on an iPhone. One is to just sweep down from the, depending on your model one of the corners, like on my iPhone here, I'll sweep down from the corner here. And then it looks like that. Now, if, if I'm, I'm in airplane mode, because I didn't want to be disturbed, but, but if I come out of airplane mode, and if I have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on, and I, I turn the Bluetooth off, it goes white. That, and people think that that's off. Now, what I'm going to do now is to go in here, and I'm going to go to settings, and I'm going to show you what and lo and behold does not does not say off it says not connected not the same thing it's still looking for a signal okay uh even if you don't have bluetooth or wi-fi like a router with wi-fi on in the house so so you have to go into um uh settings when you're not in airplane mode to actually turn off so i have to go to wi-fi here and then turn that off and then I go back and now I'm gonna go back here. And now, sorry, now it's not white anymore. It's, it's gray or transparent with a diagonal line through it. And if I go to settings, it says OFF, not, not connected. I have an article on my website, createhealthyhomes.com. Click on education in the welcome page. You have articles there that I featured. Uh, Safe for use of cell phones. And that's where this information is located for iPhones and then Android is there as well. So, so that's where you can get that information all uh, laid out for you. 
So, um, it's, man, it's let's, a challenging feat yeah. to do that, really. So, you know, if you were to just, the simplest thing would be just to turn it off. If you turn yeah. it off, you're you're going to you're going to be good. Um, but yeah, there's all these caveats to you know what is airplane mode because now they allow Wi-Fi in airplanes too. So it's complicated, but, and you don't want to you know having to navigate through Android and iPhones and know where all the spots are to click. It's it's challenging. So turning it off may be the best the best idea, or putting it in a um, a shielded compartment that's a good idea or you know if you do try to adjust the settings if you have an rf meter you know you can detect whether or not you did the correct job or not by turning off all the transmitters does that answer your question betty yes thank you um so i have some aluminum foil that's like a really thick model of aluminum foil so I could just make some sort of a little bag and line it with all this heavy foil, right? Unless EMF has those as well. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, you just and, don't want any openings, right? You've right. got to be completely sealed. Yeah. Right. Okay. They they have a metal, a, a, a cylindrical metal thing with a can with a top on it. Uh, a, a client of mine had a coffee can or, or something or, or a, a cookie tin, and it was remarkably effective. And blocking the RF signal uh, wow. that I measured, you know, with, with this. So okay, okay. Is it is it true that somebody using a cell phone can have it off, but they they're hunting their calendar or something like that? Does that still have some sort, kind of a electric field or magnetic field or something that can be affecting me? Yeah, that's a that's a twenty minute answer, Betty. Yeah. There's so much to do with cell phones nowadays uh, with yeah. magnetic electric fields, RF, the wireless yeah. things. Um, People will tell me, "Oh, I've got it off, uh, but I'm just looking at my calendar. I'm just getting data. You know, that's a DC, you know, thing." Oh, I see what you're asking. Um, but I get sick from it. So you're okay. highly sensitive. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you're sensitive if someone has a, a cell phone in the room because. That signal can be measured across the room. I still measure uh, you know, hundreds, if not a few thousand microwatts, you know, 10, six to 10 feet away from, from someone's cell phone. I'm trying to help them. I'm trying to find, and, and they've got their cell phone on, my client, you know, they're, they're walking around with their cell phone. I say, you got to turn that thing off. I can't tell you what's going on in your, in your room from these other sources that we're trying to turn off. But then they want me to get rid of their, uh, their RF, their EMFs, and they're walking around with a cell phone. It's there's an incongruity there. The problem is EMS are silent, invisible, and odorless. Number one, and number two, um, yeah, everyone wants to stay connected. And number three, uh, there are electrically sensitive people who are willing to put up with some symptoms to stay connected. So th th that's a whole nother conversation. I don't want to digress on that because we really need to wrap things up at this time. You, you opened up a can of worms at the very end here. That, that <laughs> yeah. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Betty. So quick, um, Laura, I, I measured them up to 60 and 70 feet away of some. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Well, they go for a mile. Yep. OK, all right. Now, uh, Simona, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes, there you are. Yes, I Hi, can. This, can. This is go actually ahead. Valentine, but I'm on my wife's computer, so. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for the great event. Um, I have you. two quick questions. Um, some time ago, um, a few years ago, I purchased a Cornet uh, ED88T plus um, um, meter, and it came with a little instruction sheet that allowed me to go into the settings of the meter and change the LED scale to be similar to what the Building Biology Institute recommends. I mean, what is it uh, um, no or, or little concern? What is it medium concern? What is it a high concern? And um, I recently sold that because the new version came up and I actually purchased one from Rob. Um, wait, 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 that, you, wait, you sold an ED88T plus? That, yes. is the low, that is the most recent version. Well, it's actually the G2 is the la latest version, right? Oh, oh they have, I'm sorry, they have a G, oh, okay. 5G. A 5G yeah, 5G2, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, 
I, I don't find that instruction sheet anymore. And I would very much like to uh, um, set this one up the same because it seems to me that the way it came from the factory, um, you know, in the graph, it goes all the way halfway into the graph and it, it still shows a green LED, which I'm not sure it's okay. I'm not disputing, I'm not saying it's something wrong with it. It's just that when I was able to change the settings on the other one, it seemed to be more congruent what I would see on the graph and the numbers on the display and what the LED scale would show. Right. I know I've, I've done that in the past as well. Um, I haven't tried it on a new model for sure. I'm not sure if the, did you try the same procedure that uh, the old model had? No, because I lost the instruction sheet that came with my old one. Gotcha. <laughs> you, you, might... you gentlemen. Yeah, if you, if you were to contact our support guys in the shop, um, just contact our support email, um, they can, they'll, they'll look through the manuals and get something for you. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, and yeah, no the problem. second question is for, for Orm. I'm, I'm about to install solar. And I remember in, in a video I saw a few years ago or some or another training you hosted, uh, you talked about uh, some brands of solar inverters and charge controllers that do not cause dirty electricity. Um, I don't remember what the brand is, but I'd very much like to buy that one. Uh, two primary ones and then a third one. Um, uh, N phase, E N P H A S E are microinverters, and they're cleaner. None, none of these inverters are without dirty electricity. They're cleaner than okay. the other ones. That Recommended, are on the let's say, yeah. Well, I don't rec. I don't <laughs> recommend. I don't recommend a solar panel system or photovoltaic system, PV system, for anybody who's electrically hypersensitive. Don't take the chance, because too many people have called me up and said. I, I I thought I'd be okay here, um, but I, I, I came into the house. We spent a half an hour walking around. We bought the house, and now I can't live here. Or my wow. husband talked me into it. You know, we put them, and, and and some of them are clients of mine. Other people call who, me who I've never met, and that's what they tell me. So um, I don't. I, I have too many people who have had horror stories like that. It's too big an investment because you can't undo it easily. So, okay. So having said that, you, you have to, in my book, you should be non-electrically hypersensitive to even being considering this discussion. So if you're not, I, EHS, I am not, I'm just aware that okay, okay, regardless, okay. regardless if I have symptoms or not, it's still affecting my body. So obviously I want to install the best. Of course. Yes. Okay. So for non-EHS people and you want solar, then go with Enphase or Solar Edge. Solar Edge HD Wave is the other brand. They're, in, they're a string inverter, which is on the side of the house, but they have what they call DC optimizers that go up to each panel. The whole point is that that end phase, which have the microinverters under each panel, there is no mm -hmm. string inverter on the side of the house. It comes down as, as 120 volts AC, although now they have a, a device on the side of the house, um, but they're, they have low DE. Now, then you have the energy backup management, energy management systems with the backup batteries and yep. Uh, and many people have that uh, Tesla Powerwall, Enphase, Solar Edge, and others. Uh, the Solar Edge and Enphase are DC to DC couplers. We actually had a conversation at one of our monthly meetings in, in our within our profession uh, from the husband of one of our graduates, who uh, and that man is uh, the husband is the uh, Net North American director of technical operations for for solar edge and so and he's working with some building biologists now spark and, and some other people in their group to check for the electricity and, and measure um especially their energy management systems those systems will 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 see what the load is at a given time in the daytime and they'll they'll provide power from a, from any of the three sources depending on what's most efficient the grid mm -hmm. the battery or the panels yep Okay, and they're regulating that, and and so, um, but they 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 keep the DE low, the dirty electricity low because um, they use DC to DC couplers, and and so he's aware of of dirty electricity from a health standpoint because of his wife who went through our program. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. Mark Mark. Um, anyway, forget his last yeah. name. Um, and then end phase, I, I I know from Mark uh, Michael Schwabe, uh, who's measured this. Uh, he's in San Diego, highly electrically sensitive, and he, he's an engineer, so he has all these the, the oscilloscopes and test equipment. And he's measured low DE 
from the end phase um, uh, battery backup energy management systems. Now, besides those two brands, the other brands, they have higher DE, um, their electricity, and the uh, and which goes away when the sun goes down for the solar panel systems. But mm. the energy management systems stay all active 24 seven and they generate DE 24 seven. And there's a, there's a very popular brand, which I will leave unnamed on this public forum, uh, but they're very high. So you just have to test. And, and um, when you get into energy management systems, then you're going into a whole nother realm where you got to be very careful. Again, nobody who's EHS should go anywhere near that stuff in, in our opinion. And so that's, that's my advice on that. So uh, are they so high that you can't add enough filters to filter it out? Okay. Or... <laughs> All right. So then I go into a home where, where this stuff is already in place and I yeah. got someone who's, who's maybe electrically sensitive or not, or maybe symptomatic or not. Now we're trying to filter it. Now you've got plug, you can plug in stature filters. You can plug in yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, greenway filters, or you can get the, the whole house and uh, 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 dirty electricity reduction devices, SATIC, sign tamer, uh, uh, there are others out there. Uh, there's the one from uh, Noble Electronics, uh, Robert Palma in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So, so different people in the EMF community, uh, you know, who who operate at, on the, on this more technical level, have different opinions about which of those are better, depending mm -hmm. on their. Uh, a lot of it has to do with individual tolerance, uh, and and the best I've been able to do, at least on the meters that I use is to lower it. Uh, never been able to eliminate it altogether. Uh, so it's a tough thing. The question is, can you lower it with the whole house uh, um, devices, which also include a setup that Dave Green in Michigan, another building biologist, has come up with, with, uh, you know, at the panel, you'll have uh, duplex um, outlets that go to the two legs, and you've got mm -hmm. four Greenway filters there. And then they have another filter in the middle that goes hot to hot. It's a 240 uh -huh. thing, and you have to have a special glued in thing so it's, nobody can plug something because you can really damage something as you plug into it. Um, and because it's hot to hot, it's 240. And, yep. and you, you get a special green wave that can do 240. And that takes care of most of it for a fraction of the cost of the whole house units that you buy from these other companies I mentioned. There are all these options that are out there. And, and and really, this is a, a discussion we should have off off uh, line okay. because this is a, a millimeter wave conference, and I don't want to, and we want to try and wrap it up. So, thank you so much for answering. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Kay, you slipped in there at the last. Do you have a quick question? And you'll be the last person. So the person who's Kay, unless is your hand is up, Are you want, do you have a question? If so, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, okay. Well, then I guess we're done, everyone. I, I have a quick question, Aram. Does real, does, real quick, Nancy. Does metal conduit block dirty electricity from coming into the room if you've got the wiring in metal conduit? Technically, all right. Dirty electricity has two components, electric field and magnetic field radiating into the room. And we defined dirty electricity, what and we call it microsurge electrical pollution, as the electric fields and magnetic fields from frequencies above 60 cycles per second. And the metal conduit does block the electric fields. You don't have magnetic field uh, from 60 Hertz or higher frequencies when you have balanced loads and no wiring errors between the hot and the neutral on your circuits. But the cladding has nothing to do with magnetic fields, only with electric fields. And again, this is a conversation that, that uh, uh, the only electric field that you get from dirty electricity in that case would be from the cords that you're sitting near within six or eight feet of. And then the magnetic field would only be on those paths of current in your house, like on grounding paths. Beyond that, I shouldn't go because um, we really should wrap it up. That That's sort of off topic. And, and, but um, I'm happy to talk to you about that. Um, you know, okay. thank you. Thank you, Nancy, Tony and Rob. Turn, turn it back to you guys. And you're, you're muted, Tony. Well, uh, Tony, I'll let you um, chime in as well, too. But I just like to thank everybody for attending today and thank our, our panelists um, for all being here and contributing to a, contributing valuable information to this new field we're 
engulfed in these millimeter waves. Um, so thank, thank you everybody and appreciate you guys attending and um, we'll uh, schedule this again um, for a month or two down the road and um, continue to learn and continue to get some, uh, to continue to find some new sources and bring them forward to you and uh, continue the education here. So Tony, I'll let you uh, I close say it say Thank you, thank you as well. Um, Oram, you're gonna stop recording. Uh, all right, I'll do that now. Yeah, I'm recording and uh, thank you.